Hello and welcome to the Saladcast on Sunday, the fourth of September, twenty twenty-two. I'm your host Dan Train. Joining me today, Zachary Burgess. Not actually the law this time, though. We've only had that and happen twice. <laughs> also, Robert Kemp. Can't picture you as a law enforcer. No. You think? Yeah, Zach, Zach, you're, you're a bit enforcement. I don't why. Well, a I stickler guess... for the rules. Yeah, I suppose that's true. <laughs> don't, don't that. <laughs> you could ra- raise your voice when things are. Uh, not proper. I suppose you could be a well. No, actually, you'd be the sort of t- sort of type that would like like pull someone over, right, and then just walk up and and be like, wouldn't have done it like that. Is <laughs> <laughs> how you actually do. Is how you is how you should have driven. <laughs> now then, now then. Oh, right, I'm getting the and demonstrate how it should mm. be done. They never do that, do they? They tell you how you've gone wrong, but they don't show you how to improve. <laughs> so I've got footage of your driving in my car, right? That's, that's, um, I've run this through the police AI, and it's is, it is showing me uh, how you should have driven that section. Oh, look, nobody died. <laughs> <laughs> in contrast to what you just displayed. <laughs> Somebody Multiple died. Multiple casualties <laughs> and one fatality. <laughs> I mean, that'd be Shouldn't quite useful, like that. useful technology. It's like, ooh. <laughs> Would that be useful technology after a random <laughs> fatal accident where you're like, we've run it through the AI, and here's how you should have done it to avoid all this death. Oh, well. <laughs> <laughs> the, AI, the AI says that your car was the one at fault. Well, yes, that's already what okay. they already do for you, man. Mm. But not, not in the context you were implying, where it's like, <laughs> here's how you should have done it. <laughs> <laughs> learn from this mistake. Learn, learn from this. Now be on your way. <laughs> I'll let you go with a warning now. <laughs> That's the Zach enforcement approach. Yeah. I cannot be asked to take you to the station right now. <laughs> <laughs> it's just too far. And I've got other stuff to do. Too far. It's too far. Oh, <laughs> what, what, what are you working on right now? Well, I'm building this killer factory in Factorio. On your way, sir. Yes, <laughs> you're, you're doing God's work. Just don't do it in the car. <laughs> that's the tone. That, that's <laughs> definitely the tone you would use. Just don't do it in your car. <laughs> you got any uh, law enforcement stories for us, Dad? <laughs> Apart from all the I cops constantly to... driving past Dad's house. Well, yeah. Well, you can hear them because I live in a city. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know if they're more often... No, they are. There's probably an equal mix of police and uh, fire and ambulances. There is a fire station in Stoke Newton, so you occasionally get you get the uh, fire engines more often than you'd think hmm. um, driving by here. But yeah, but you do get like dramatic um, like chains of them sometimes. Like sometimes you get like along this road, like a whole bunch of unmarked police cars all with sirens going, all all heading in the same direction at once in like in quick succession. And then if an ambulance like, and a fire engine are with them, you know something's happened. Oh, yeah, you really know that. But, yeah, that's less common. But, yeah, I don't know why they even bother with those unmarked police cars because it's so obvious which ones they are because they all have the same make, usually, of the same black color beamer. scheme. Yeah, yeah, or they're, like, dark gray. Uh, and you can pretty much see where the lights are going to be, you know, when they come on. Yeah, and then I know what they're trying to do because they, look, they do look a lot like parking sensors where the lights go but, not, yeah, but they're often too big right i just don't think they i'm sure they a lot of people see them and don't think they're a police car but if you're actually a criminal then you're down you're bound to know yeah, <laughs> if you yeah. uh, the people who actually care you know they'll, they'll maybe actually, that's it there'll probably be a youtube vid where they'll be like how to spot an unmarked police car <laughs> yeah well i think they're pretty obvious and i don't i'm not looking out for them so i don't know I don't understand what they're for. But Probably anyway. slightly harder to notice while you're actually driving because you have yeah. very yeah, limited fields of views through like mirrors or whatever. I think there's only been a couple of that's times true. where I've, like ever, where I've sort of thought to myself, that, that's probably an unmarked car. Yeah. But at yeah. a distance, honestly, when you're driving, it's like that's where it's going to be hard to tell, right? Yeah, like, yeah like, I guess that's the idea. Yeah. So you can, as long as you're. As long as you're using the video game mechanic of staying a certain distance behind the person you're following. The real life mechanic of what you should be doing whenever you're driving. <laughs> True. Yeah. It's not a great video game mission. <laughs> the real knows. way in real life is to have lots of them, right? Or be, be following one 
you know, it's the same with following someone on the street. You need like instead of one person hanging back, you need like five you people. You trade because, off the followers yeah, 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 yeah. as you go along. Yeah, yeah. that radio each subtle. other and then move somewhere else, and then yeah, mm. they chain. That's but then they need to be like it. running. <laughs> so if you see like the same guy run past you like five times as the chain moves, <laughs> <laughs> like, yeah. you can move, Just move around. Ahead of them. Yeah. Just keep moving them through. But yeah, no, I don't have any law, uh, law enforcement tales of, of, of late, <laughs> apart from seeing them go by my window and you guys hearing them on the on the cast. No, I've only had like one or two drive past here in the middle of the day. There was one that had sirens on once, and I think we've seen the odd blue light flash through the window. I'm not quite sure on what route we would be here. Mm, but... Yeah. Where are they coming from and going to if they're passing by your place? Maybe Creeting proper or, you know, going off. Yeah, maybe. On the bit, in, the, hills. the bit in between Creeting and Stollen where you have to go under the A14, really. Yeah, There's maybe. not very many crossing places. Yeah, maybe, maybe that way. That way. Come out of Needham for some reason. They well, just from to be there. the Stone Market, I guess. You're coming. Well, yeah, they wouldn't necessarily come past us. No, way, but... I suppose, but it depends where they were when they started. Exactly. Yeah. They're not always starting from the police station. <laughs> yeah. It's not like that kind of video game. It's still, it's still mildly surprising that I've even seen a couple, I guess. Like... But not many. Not many at all. Hell, I haven't even had to shout horse. Like, I haven't seen the horses very much this year. There's always, there's always, always like it's once once a week there'd be like some, you know, horse, a, a horse <laughs> some some horse just wandering, ridden obviously, yes, not, obviously. Just, not just a horse just walking by tipping its hat to me. Like, but... Modern. <laughs> it's a shame you don't see that just a horse on its own just, just cantering down the road just to, like. <laughs> Just look, just looks to you and gives an extra large head nod, just to acknowledge your presence, and then carries on. Yeah. A I strong, continue. independent horse don't need no rider. Exactly. <laughs> I'll show that little Nas. I can go down the old town road any time I want. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I can walk till I can't no more. <laughs> I haven't seen any horses in the city lately. You used to you used to see them more often. Mounted um, police, po- yeah, mounted police, yeah. I don't know why the, the specifically the city of London you'd see them going around. I don't know why they have a horse unit. It's like the most urban area in the country. And they, I suppose it's just <laughs> but it's also tradition, right? <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's tradition. City of London yeah. is going to be where you're going to get random extra tradition layer. That's true. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. But, but I think you're right. Weird. I think it is crowd control, isn't it? It's... Yeah. The imposition of the How close are you to a football stadium? <laughs> yeah. That's where you'll see the mounted police. Yeah. Well, I'm pretty close to the Arsenal one, but I don't go near there, so I, 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 I'm sure they have them there uh, on match days. Um, they definitely have them at Wembley and stuff. Mm. They pro- probably have them at an Ipswich, don't they? I'm uh, never in town on a match day. Or like <laughs> intentionally, a, most of the time. Yeah. Well, that's well, that's not strictly true. We were sort of in Ipswich Town last weekend, which was a home game, but like not anywhere near the football stadium. Mm. The football stadium is sort of conveniently out of the it's way in Ipswich. Kind of awkward, yeah. It's <laughs> conveniently not, it's, slash and inconveniently, depending on which side of the equation you're on. Yeah. It's not a. It's not a thoroughfare. I can't even remember the last, like, if I've ever seen a mounted police. Sure really? Have. Yeah. Yeah, even even Noam was just saying, it's like, it's like I've seen them in London. <laughs> and Bristol. Right, cities. I'm, I'm trying to transcribe the audio that you can't hear on a yeah. podcast from miles away. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, uh, yeah, oh, the... Police horses in cities and uh, other civilian horses in the countryside. <laughs> that seems <laughs> civilian right. horses. Civilian horses. <laughs> They're allowed to wear jeans. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> jeans and a t-shirt. Classic horse wear. <laughs> Turning it around slightly to... Um, to be vaguely on topic, maybe? To be vaguely no, on topic. I doubt <laughs> it. Okay. Um, no, I mean... 
yeah, it's a podcast about video games. <laughs> um, uh, there'll be some news about Gamescom later on, and I, I wasn't going to talk about it because they had a trailer for Monkey Island, right? The new Monkey Island game. But they were saying right, yeah. that as a pre-order bonus, um, you can get some horse armor. And, um, Classic. Um, but it, they they were up front and said, it doesn't actually do anything. It will just sit in your inventory for the entire game. Okay. Oh, right. <laughs> you can't it's not, actually... It's not actually a usable item. Apply it to anything. <laughs> okay. It's just like, you'll just get some horse armor. That's like... It's like the oldest of old memes. Yeah, it's quite old. That's, as well, it's still a reference. It's, but that's like the original... I mean, it's not, but it's the original famous microtransaction, isn't it? It's, well, it's, it's, the, it's, it's from that's Oblivion, saying, right? It's such an yeah. old, old meme that like no one's even going to get that joke at this point. Well, but the thing is that microtransactions are just perennially relevant because they well, I don't never know, go away, like, do they? They've kind yeah. of been falling off somewhat recently, which is why everyone stopped talking about them more to or less. To an extent. Yeah. I mean, you could... Like, I mean, yeah, to an extent. They, they definitely still exist, though, right? Because well, you can yes, still absolutely. consider, like, buying V-Bucks yeah. for Fortnite is a microtransaction. Yes. Even though it's, oh, like, yeah. the minimal tra- minimum transaction is, like, a fiver, it's still considered, like, micro. Well, f- a fiver like, is micro, and probably always was. How much did the horse armor cost, mm-hmm. like, three, four quid? I yeah, imagine. maybe. But I, I, I thought the whole concept of... The original concept of microtransactions was, like, sub-dollar, I think. I don't like, think that was the original. It, it, never, it never actually panned out that well, way. Okay, no, the original idea of microtransactions specifically when before they became synonymous with DLC, maybe. Mm. But now that that means the same thing, the micro part of microtransactions is not actually relevant any longer. Yeah, well, I still think microtransactions and DLC are conceptually two Yes, they are, but no yeah. one uses the words that way. And I mean, I was surprised when I saw the word microtransactions. Like, it's got to the point where it's like they're so prevalent that it's like seeing the word microtransaction is is. You don't expect them to even be a relevant enough yeah. thing for people to say. It's an, it's an oddly nostalgic feeling <laughs> from the word microtransaction. I mean, I kind of want to go back to calling them Matrix, but like, because it was the Don Matrix era, right? <laughs> Right, yeah. And they started pervading everything Microsoft did for a while. It's a shame that macro transaction never took off. Macro transaction. That was the one from Eve. That's like buying a car. <laughs> well, that, I mean, that was like, as soon as you get the micro transaction slash DLC where it's like, this costs 50 quid. It's just mm-hmm. like, that's a macro transaction. <laughs> Can't call them micro. No, I mean, at that point, isn't it just a transaction? Yes. Cause... <laughs> A macro transaction in games would be like buying a ship in um, that other space game that's not come out. <laughs> Star Citizen. Star Citizen, that's it. I don't think those are that... Well, I mean, because some of them were that expensive. Some but of there, were, there were some that were just like normal micro transaction costs. Sure, yeah. <laughs> Slash macro transaction. And also those weren't really... You could argue that the really expensive ships weren't even meant to be like microtransactions. They were meant to be like Kickstarter almost. Sure, yeah. Like fund the studio. Except it became microtransactions later once they moved out of their Kickstarter phase and still continued to get far too much money for their own good. <laughs> like you're never coming out. <laughs> but it doesn't matter. I bet Chris Sawyer can retire now. <laughs> I think he could probably always retire. <laughs> yeah, probably. I think he needed to make this game to continue to have some amount of money. Some amount of money. Hey, you know what? I didn't spend some amount of money on. Okay. Because, it, because it turned up on uh, Amazon Prime. Right. I we, we, we watched the hell out of Everything Everywhere all at once. Oh, I hope you enjoyed that. I thought you'd like that. Freaking awesome. <laughs> I thought so. <laughs> I loved yeah. it. Yeah, it was. I really enjoyed it. It's it was madness. Really good. Like it's a little madness. bit. It's a, it's a bit too long, slightly. Maybe um, a touch. I mean, I had to be slightly worried with its structure and the fact mm. that, like, like it goes part one, which is most of the film. Oh yeah, as yeah, it turns yeah, out. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Part, then and then part two is the back back section, and then you, and then it's sort of like part three. Oh no, wait. That's that. That's all right. We're done. We're done. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, it's it's properly good. It's like the way I try to describe it as it's definitely got some of that like it's there's something about the fact that it is a low budget a yeah, low ish pretty... budget production that works so in its favour. Yeah. 
like it is pretty low budget compared to you know films it's referencing mm. obviously yeah uh but it's got some great performances in and Absolutely. Uh, and they do with that and their limitations of that budget they got a lot out of the effects that they did do which is it's quite effects heavy like uh but they managed to um do yeah, it in a creative uh, way really, uh, yeah, yeah only really in spots like yeah it's, not, it's yeah. like most of the effects are lighting or practical or, yeah exactly yeah uh, yeah or you know light animation here and there it's um yeah it's it's yeah the, it's just clever enough in its ideas it's like i'm sort of getting like jojo's bizarre adventure vibes from some of it yeah it's just like what do we need here well i don't know we'll just do something we've never thought of before and just chuck it in <laughs> and when i'm like all right cool let's go with it because <laughs> it, it takes such a long time setting up its own premise and then yeah it's kind of well, it is super. It's like it's super necessary, but all the detail they then go into really isn't necessary, and it's hilarious because it's just, it, that feels so anime to me. It's like they went so yeah, in, yeah. They went so hard in like the the exposition early That's on, true. and then very little of it is actually relevant. <laughs> no. Did you notice that the father is played by the guy who played Short Round? Oh, in, uh, Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom. <laughs> I didn't he's make that connection, but he looks yeah. familiar. He's the kid. <laughs> I don't think he's been acting in anything in between much. <laughs> right. Uh, yes. <laughs> Okie dokie, Dr. Jones. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And he's good in it as well. Yeah, he is good. Yeah. I just keep referring to him as Short Round, which is a bit <laughs> insensitive, but yeah, he was really good. And Michelle Yeoh is just really good. Sure. You know, she's great. Uh, and uh, and the, I like the uh, the daughter. Um, she popped up. I knew her, the actress, because she popped up in um, uh, Orgrafina's, uh, um sitcom, like Nora from Queens. She's in that a little bit as this. She's in one episode as like playing um, a, um, a friend of uh, the character's grandma. So it's set in the fifties or whatever. Uh, 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 which was which is cool, but then she they keep wanting to bring her back, so they have to put her in old makeup, old old lady makeup, to make it make sense to have her in the, in the present day. Mm. Which is kind of cool, anyway. Uh, but she was re- she's really good in that, and she was good in the, in everything everywhere all at once. I thought, yeah, yeah. The everything bagel was a little overplayed, but uh, <laughs> it was a cool concept. Sucked. Into a bagel, oh. <laughs> and I like the references. Like they didn't care. They were like, I was like, oh, the, the first Matrix reference. I was like, oh, they're actually going there. And then they made like five Matrix references in in ten minutes. Oh yeah, they don't. They don't. Like, they don't they yeah, care. They, don't care. they don't care. And then they but, started yeah. referencing Ratatouille, <laughs> which is like my favorite Pixar yeah. movie. I, I was mm, like, I was, I was good. For, yeah, that's. I was sort of going to be remiss to mention that because it is one of the the fact, Rakakuni. <laughs> they just go. Mm, yeah, spoilers slightly. I, I, yeah, I would consider that I a spoiler. Um, what that there's a reference to? Yeah, like just because, just because it's like pretty much anything they do in that film, they commit to is what I would yeah, say. That, that's it's the like, thing. Yeah, things aren't throwaway. It's like every everything that they no. they raise recurs. And that's it's true. like so so almost anything is a spoiler in this film because it's just like it, it will keep coming up in some form and keep surprising you. With that well, sorry if I spoiled it, <laughs> listeners, but there's a Ratatouille reference that <laughs> is committed to, I guess. <laughs> but yeah, it's it's pretty funny. Uh, yeah, it's cool. It, yeah, I think that's the trick. It somehow manages to maintain its funniness while still and while has, being as random as it wants to be. And it does have an emotional core that isn't cheesy. Like actually, sure, it does it works. does work. Yeah, it does. Uh, <laughs> I mean, that core plot point and like where the the various. Uh, okay, this isn't a spoiler, but it isn't because it's like sort of in the trailer. But it's like it's about multiple parallel universes, yeah, uh, all all happening at the same time. And it's like there's a certain thought, like like how the universes end up, that sort of lingered with me a little bit. That's just like okay, that's kind of interesting, but not quite. I see what they're trying to do, but that's not actually how it went down. And if you think about it, kind of thing that that, that I. I quite like. Yeah, it. yeah. Has, has enough lingering in some aspects where you're just like, where you know, your brain stays on it for a bit, which is always cool. I guess this is spoiler, but like, 
My love. I really like. I really Sound like the, the joke. <laughs> I really like the joke, the core joke that she is the one because of all out of all the different versions of her in every different universe, she's the most useless. Oh yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> Therefore, has the most potential. I think that might have been yeah. in a trailer at some point. That, like, yeah, I mean, yeah, that yeah. is you really are living funny. your worst life, <laughs> worst possible life. Yeah, <laughs> that's what makes her special. Yeah, yeah, that is pretty good. <laughs> Anyway, yeah, yeah. You great should, film. You should totally yeah. watch that film. It's excellent. Yeah, I want to see it again. I mean, at some point. I haven't seen any of the other the Daniels work, but like, um, no, uh, but they that supposedly they're. I mean, my mate of mine was telling me about their previous film with Daniel Radcliffe, um, right? Swiss Army Man, right? The farty movie. The yeah. farty movie, yeah, <laughs> uh, and that it's um, like the concept is funny and original, but it probably should have been a short film, not a not a full film, and that that had me a little worried about going into this. Um, mm. that perhaps they couldn't carry the concept as far as they could, as far as that, you know. But they seem like, like, the concepts are cool. <laughs> That's all I'm going to say. The concepts are cool, but like, they finally, they got the execution right this time. Not enough googly eyes. Moving on. Uh, they, they were all over the cinema when I went. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> In the loos and everything, and all oh, that. amazing. That's <laughs> yeah. pretty good. Helping cheap yeah. promotion. Yeah, yeah, very cheap promotion. That could, could have done with more Google eyes. <laughs> That's cool. Yeah. Jamie Lee Curtis was good as well. Oh I yeah, thought. they were all good in it. Yeah, yeah. If, if if anything, I found the the husband almost maybe the the weak link, but he's like out not of the bad. acting. But he's not bad, is what I say. Yeah. It's like he's, yeah. but it's um um. But it's, especially during the early scenes, it's a little bit hard to mm. take seriously, which is weird. Mm, yeah, yeah. Like given the con, given the context of this film, to say. Mm. But I was getting some Jet Li's the one vibes from his performance. Oh, okay, if that makes sense. Enough. Like, cool. So, I highly recommend it. I did recommend that to you, didn't I? Yeah, yeah. We, I mean, we've I talked about it before, and it's been on my want, yeah. want to watch list since forever. Yeah. So it's, that's a good one. My big one that you haven't seen, right, is Parasite. You've got to watch sure. that. We've got to watch that. We'll, we'll watch that together. I'll be up for watching that again. Uh, that's, but that's like a good, a very good movie. That's not like an R, because our, 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 our normal thing lately is to watch crappy action movies, right? Um, yeah, stuff. like, yeah, sort of like on the, but the, not, in, not necessarily intended as a comedy, but like are somehow pretty funny. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We can continue that tradition, but we should watch Parasite at some point, but because it's r- real, real good. I don't know what it is about. Parasite. I don't know why it's not appealing to me. I guess it's hard to. The like, name is off-putting. Yeah, that. <laughs> and I, like, I guess I just don't. I'm not sure I found the thing to latch on to, right? From a, from yeah. a marketing perspective, so there's no. It doesn't. Yeah. Does, even though so everyone said so many good things about it, and like I get it, sure, whatever, yeah. like. I haven't found the thing that I latch to to be like, yeah. this makes me want to see this. You just need someone to make you watch it and then you'll be like, <laughs> oh, this is great. Yeah, perhaps, perhaps I just need to be like taped to a chair. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so that's that's movies. Movie! I guess. I think there was much else I really watched uh, in the last couple of weeks. Talk about because we've been, been sort. I think we sort of mentioned the end of Stranger Things last time, and yada yada yada. Uh, oh, I watched the first episode last night of the Lord of the Rings thing. I haven't oh, seen yeah. the Game of Thrones thing, but I tried the Lord of the Rings. Well, I'm not I probably watch should... the Game of Thrones thing, but like, because of... no, 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 you'd be better off. Presumably, be better off watching the original series if you were going like to. I think at least half of it. It's a prequel. <laughs> yeah, watch half and then. Who was telling me they watched half and then stopped? Um, I hear that quite a bit. Yeah, but that's a good idea. Like, watch the first, I don't know, three, four seasons of Game of Thrones and then stop. That's fine. Yeah, maybe um, there's a good cutoff point somewhere. And it's like, I think like, there is. Yeah. Um, but yeah, Lord of the Rings. Um, obviously, it was, it's all just establishing things uh, for the first episode. But it does look beautiful, of course, because it's. I think it's the most expensive TV show ever made. Uh, um, because it's all of Jeff Bezos' money plowed into it. Mm. Um, but like, it does. It all. It it it's it's not. It, it's not a disaster for a start, <laughs> no, <laughs> which is good. Um, and um, I I've always 
looked at all, all the prior marketing and stuff, it looks like the casting for Galadriel was really good, and that seems to be true. Like she seems really good, uh, um, and the Elrond guy seems decent as well. So who was it before? Is, is, it, is that Liv Tyler's? Is it Liv Tyler? No, uh, no, Galadriel no. is uh, Kate Blanchett, right? Kate Blanchett, that's yeah, it. Um, but obviously, this is a much younger version of the character. But it's a bit weird with elves because they're immortal. So it's like <laughs> they're not, not much younger. Mm. It, yeah. Um, basically exactly the same sort of but it is a younger Galadriel and Elrond I mean how much younger I think it's like 2,000 years no no longer more than that Two, three thousand years <laughs> I think well they say in the film don't they that the battle the original battle with Sauron was 3,000 years ago so slightly more than that presumably oh it's longer than that then yeah because uh, this is quite a long time before that technically but yeah. it's but it depends because the thing is they're going to speed up this they're gonna cr they're gonna oh, cram see. like a thousand years of history into a few years to, to enable them to do a story i guess um oh i see so they're gonna crunch the real law they're the... gonna crunch the real law yeah to make it happen faster which is fine um I mean, they didn't uh, necessarily have to do that with the elves because then you still have the elves that are always the same. You, you just have but, to bring in other new characters, I guess. Well, but... yeah, yeah. I've, I've seen stuff. You know, there's humans, right? Sure. <laughs> there's there's men and there's even pointlessly, which I, I'll, I'll see what they do with it, but they do have sort of hobbits. They're not hobbits, they're halfits because hobbits technically didn't exist at the time or, you know, <laughs> so it's too, too early proto, for hobbits. Proto-hobbits. <laughs> proto-hobbits. There's no Shire or anything at this point. Um, uh, but yeah, Lenny Henry. <laughs> what really? Yeah, he seems to be the leader of the Hobbits. <laughs> from, okay, from what I could see from the first episode. Uh, yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, and the dialogue and stuff—it is of that. It it's in keeping with the films. Let's put it that way. There, mm. There's there seems to be some half quoting of and references to the films in both the dialogue and the music right. and the music. Is, they're not licensed to be able to use any of it, right? Like the no, record. the licensing's really weird. I mean, the weirdest part, as a book f fan or whatever, is that they technically don't have the rights to the Silmarillion, um, but they so they have the rights to like the appendices of the Lord of the Rings. Um, gotcha. Yeah, that was the because uh, there was a, some there's some loophole, isn't there, that meant that it wasn't actually covered by the owner the other the rest of the ip ownership somewhere like there was like this this was a, a weirdly convenient and specific gap that this could fall in. yeah i mean the second age that there's not that much writings on it, it you know because the silmarillion covers like the, the the early times and then the first age mostly and then it only really has one chapter about the, the numenor or whatever the, 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 in the second age um and then I guess the Lord of the Rings appendices covers more of the Second Age stuff, but like, but that means that they have to because they're flashing back in the first episode to the First Age and before because they show like Galadriel when she was a child or whatever. But then they can't they reference stuff like they show the trees in the at the very beginning. They show the trees that mm. lit up lit the world before the existence of the sun and the moon, um, and they show the trees dying or whatever which is important right but they can't they don't have the rights to silmarillion so they can't show how the trees actually died and they don't show the bit because there's a giant spider like she lob but bigger that kills the trees and they right. don't show that, I can't see that. and th and then they sh it shows the elves coming from valinor across to middle earth but it doesn't say anything about all the crazy stuff that was happening there and how um like how the elves killed a bunch of other elves to get the ships to do that crossing and how a bunch of them, including Galadriel, were left behind and couldn't go by boat and had to go, like, literally walk across the Arctic Circle, basically across the ice huh. flows to get there. But they skip all of that uh, because they don't have the rights or whatever, I think. So, so it's a this, bit weird. So is this all, like, prologue stuff or is it, like, actually embedded in the episode, like... Well, that's why I mean, it's a bit like the first film where they 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 show the first scene is is um, flashback or whatever gotcha. prologue, but then there's the occasional flashback just to give context. But it's a bit confused because it's like conflating a bunch of stuff from the first age and before. But they don't have the rights to show the real stuff, so you can't really blame them. You weird. know, it's yeah. it's weird. Is it like, uh, but, but like like to the point where they probably could have got away with just not giving you any of that and because it's not yeah. in the time period of the story they want to tell 
Well, they're trying to show the motivation because the idea is that like evil, the the great evil has been defeated, and Sauron because uh, the great evil is Morgoth or whatever, and he's been defeated at the end of the first age, and it's hundreds of years later, and Sauron they don't know where he is, and it seems like evil has gone from the world, but Galadriel's like, no, he's got to be out there. We, we you know feels uneasy about it, and that's obviously going to be the story that. He's going. Sauron's going to appear and then make the rings and all of that stuff. Could it have been um, done with a cheesy like, like narration over text, like some games start, <laughs> and like like and they could have just been done with it and been, just get it over done quick with so no one really like actually focuses. I on guess this, I don't just, know how just much give you enough information to go on. I think that's basically what they they did because that's also what uh, the, the 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 prologue at the start of the film, the, the ship, the ring or whatever is two minutes long or something. And it's just mm. narration. And that conflates a bunch of stuff as well, which is fine. Cause it's explaining what's going on. But like, like it puts, it, it puts like two wars into one, um, sure. you know, that battle, whether he killed, he cuts the ring off Sauron's hand or whatever. Yeah. Anyway. I mean, um, you, can, you can sort of set that up as like a conversation in my head, like where it's just like two mm. people talking to each other. And it's like, look, there's a lot of history here, but all you need to know is. <laughs> well, that's, they also have done that. And pr- probably the best bit in the first episode is Elrond talking to Galadriel and just doing a bit of exposition, but in a well-written way, you know, mm. that actually has character motivation behind it and stuff. So it seems, anyway, that's only in the first episode, but it seems a decent setup. Uh, and um, uh, considering what they have the rights to, it's not breaking any law too badly yet. Uh, and, uh, there's some interesting, I mean, and and it's got these men, which are who seem to be living in what they call the Southlands, but I think where they are is actually in Mordor before Mordor, you know, exists as a you know a burned black mm. hellscape or whatever. So that's kind of interesting. Uh, they seem to be men that are descendants of men that fought on the wrong side on the bad side in the first age or something and the elves are like watching them you know Hmm. hundreds of years later to make sure they don't screw up again (laughs) i don't know it's kind of weird so that's kind of an interesting setup like there's an elf there who's watching them who's falling in love with one of the women or whatever so kind of yeah kind of an interesting setup so anyway not bad so far like a decent Hmm. setup um we have, yeah, we nearly pressed play on it until we saw that everything everywhere all at once was right next to it on the. Oh yeah, I definitely, definitely watched that. Like, I definitely watched that. We were just like, yeah. oh wait a minute. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, I would. Yeah, if you haven't seen everyone, everything everywhere all at once, definitely watch that first. Drop everything. Yeah, the fun was hovering. <laughs> hmm. It was at that stage. Anyway. Fantasy sci-fi stuffs seems to be plenty of it around at the moment. Mm. I'm still working my way through the boys season three. Slowly. Oh, yeah. I don't think I could watch that quickly. It's a not it's... a bit too heavy to binge. Right? Uh, heavy's not necessarily the right right word. It's just sometimes that yeah. There's I mean there's always there's always some amount of death. <laughs> it's not it's not a happy yeah. tale. No. <laughs> And I think that's what like, I was saying because in a weird way it seems, Game of Thrones you... has that of course and it's like you were like that's a reason maybe not to watch it because it's pretty violent and grim yeah but like I mean, it's, if, it's, you can, it's, if you can manage the boys I'm sure you can manage it it seems less uh, Game of Thrones. jovial this season like you know there's there's, mm. few, there's fewer I mean there's, there's a light edge to, to to the horror I suppose uh in in mm. before that's like seemingly not here at the moment It's still all right. I'm still enjoying it. I don't know where, it's going. I don't know where it's going to go. I don't know how they're going to win this one. <sighs> it's a good noise. The drama. Should we move on to video games? Mm, video games. Mm, video games. What's mm. the news? News. Well, the big news since last time is that Gamescom happened. Gamescom. It was back in the flesh. And continued the theme of this year's 
I don't know, marketing them being not all that interesting. Yeah, I mean, I guess. <laughs> all of this year's marketing efforts by every company have been kind of there. <laughs> yeah, I guess it fell a little bit into the category of like, oh, hold up, this is just, you know, it's the problem with like E3 and these sorts of shows is they've they've moved away too much into the CG, this doesn't tell you anything, trailer territory. All it's really oh. giving you is the mood and the, a bit of setup, and it doesn't really tell you a huge amount about the game most of the time. So it's impossible to judge. I mean, that like, was always kind of E3. Yeah, to an extent. Like, you're not, you're not wrong, but like, I, I feel like there used to be more gameplay demos or more in-engine things. Well, I think or... that's more, in the, like, it's a bit thinking about this case in particular that's more a function of the fact that this isn't just one company so right, I mean, yeah. they are doing their like focus Bigger on our deals. big game and then do the montages of the smaller games sure, these yeah. are all just like rated the same essentially sure and they're very quick slices because they don't have the time because they've got so many things to show yeah right yeah it's not like a an xbox showcase where they can sit back and spend the time to talk about forza Whatever the new one's called, just Forza, Forza Motorsport, <laughs> the Forza, the, the Forza thing, um, Kings of Forza. <laughs> um, but there's there's a there's a couple of things I've picked out here, um, some of which I probably will just be a brief mention. <laughs> yeah, as um, always. So I'm going to start with Everywhere because I have no idea what this is. It's the sequel to everything. Every, really. Yeah, everything, so everywhere. Not. And then eventually we'll get all at once. All at um, once. I don't know what, the, what they're trying to tell me here, because it, they, they're trying to make it sound like this is some kind of creative platform, but also a game that's... So you make things in it, and the engine is capable of dealing with any sort of game and any sort of thing you can imagine. And, and, like it, and I'm thinking, is it Dreams? Is this just is this some some other company attempting to make a dreams like project? There's plenty of them, and there's all the random ones that are linked to NFTs, of course. Sure, basically are trying to do that. And I vaguely sort of thought back to whatever Microsoft's project was. Do you remember that? Like the one that had Conquer in it. Yeah. Um, like Spark. Spark. Yes, that's it. I've been trying to remember that name for a week. Um, that was like a much smaller thing, but was like more functionally like a programming. Yeah, thing. it was. I mean, that was that 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 it thing. Was a game in, creation device, but on like a small scale. Yeah, that thing's intent was supposed to be like, yeah, here's an introduction to game creation. Yeah, like and the concepts behind it. Um, and we'll, we'll, we've built some tools for you. And Dreams, to a certain extent, is that, but then goes. A bit further. Yeah, probably a lot further, actually, than Spark did. This, I I can't work out if this is that. I just, like, the marketing is so strange and woolly and vague. And then they showed some stuff that showed, like, that had a campaign of sorts with a dude in it, like a very well, suddenly very well-rendered guy with a shocked face. <laughs> and it's just like, wait, so you're putting a sort of, I don't know, a Quantic Dream-esque storyline in this as well. I have no idea what this is. It is weird. <laughs> um, and, the, like, yeah, I don't, I don't get it. I don't get it. But it's worth mentioning just because, like, it's so vague. Like, I don't think I've ever come across a, a pitch quite so... I have no idea what you're talking about. <laughs> Except for, like, the first pictures of Dreams and whatnot. <laughs> well, <laughs> at least... Well, dr- <laughs> I mean, Dreams was weird in the sense that when the, the first demo for that was them doing that puppet show with move control. Yeah, exactly. Right? Which is like, like, what the fuck is this? Well, it's, just like, well, it's, it's, a, it's an animation studio of some description. We're like using the power of the move and we can make them. It's a sculpt, it's a creative tool. Like, at least you knew that much. I don't think like, you did, though, in that very first translation. It's like they showed you the puppetry thing and then that was more or less it. Hmm. <laughs> they just moved on. Yeah, maybe you're right. Maybe you're right. I thought they showed some sculpting or something at that point, but maybe not. I don't know if they did. I yeah, maybe might have been later. Dune is getting a game. Another game. That looks like it's been styled off the uh, recent film adaptation. <laughs> right. Uh, not directly licensed, but, uh, well, it is licensed. Yeah, I assume June, so, but yeah. Not, not from the film, yeah. Uh, yeah, it's not following the plot or anything like that because they're doing something different. They're calling it Dune Awakening, and it's going to be a survival MMO where it really? looks like you might be a Fremen, or at least that—that uh, that was okay. the trailer. At least, yeah, it's going to be problematic I mean, as an MMO. <laughs> an MMO, 
that's how they've described it as a as an open how? world survival MMO. Wow, it's not the most. Um, well, I don't know. Maybe I'm maybe I'm wrong, but it's not the most varied landscape. No, it's all <laughs> but I suppose different. the point is that it, it kind of is, uh, and it's the Fremen that know how to mm. make sense of the landscape. But like you know, for an average person, <laughs> I think yeah. I mean, you, it, the trailer ended with him doing some worm riding. So, yeah, not a very MMO activity either. No, and watching <laughs> the uh, who's the house that's in control in Dune? Is it Harkonnen? I'm like, I can never remember. They're the baddies. Yeah. They're, oh, Harkonnen's the baddies. Who are the Atreides? Atreides. Atreides. Right. Yeah, seeing one of their yeah. um, harvester things get munched by the worm. That's basically all this trailer has. Yep, I mean, it happens. No gameplay footage, but that was the the, the takeaway words: survival MMO. <laughs> Will you have a still suit water meter thing? Probably. Almost certainly. I mean, the, <laughs> like there probably isn't going to be hunger. It's just going to be water management, uh, right? Right. That doesn't sound that fun. <laughs> I mean, survival <laughs> MMOs do not appeal to me in any way. No. Like, like anyway, but like, I mean, it's fun to read about. And... I, I think they're going to go for like a Valheim, right? Because right. that's to me that is the closest thing to survival mmo right well, it'll be but, like the mm. conan game right that sort of zero. oh god right <laughs> <laughs> that's going back a bit not that old it's relatively old but it's pretty old at this point well yes it is but i would call that a survival mmo probably okay anything that anything with permadeath i guess counts as a survival mmo in the mmo sphere right yeah yeah uh, do you think do you think it will have that? I mean, like you run out of water and then you have to start a new character. <laughs> I don't know how I it's mean, a survival. Or like, you, how do you make yeah. the survival aspect of it meaningful without doing yeah. something like that? I don't know. Like, you make it like a rogue. Well, light. I mean, then, then the question really becomes like, what is the goal? What are you mm. trying to do yeah, yeah, <laughs> while yeah. you're alive? Exactly. <laughs> There must be get to the worm riding, I guess. That's <laughs> is that get the... to the worm riding. Yeah. Once once you've done that, you are master fremen. Yeah. Roll credits. You ride it around for a while, blow some shit up, and then that's the end of the game. Well, there must be like an ending to games like Valheim, right? Where it's like you've got to you've learn the weirding the way, right? The, the weirding way, yeah. when you use your voice to blow the shit, blow things up. <laughs> nice. It's like the 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 not force that you, they have. You meet the sisters and. Go for yeah. your training. Yeah, I, I I don't know. It's a, it's a it's a really cool world, Dune. But I that's quite a narrow aspect of it to be survivalist on 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 Dune like the Fremen. I don't know how you make that a fun game, but I guess they're going to try. The more I think about Dune, the less I think that can really do much with it in video games. Well, I mean, the obvious option would the be... The RTSs to... were fine. Well, you know. yeah, the RTSs yeah. were fine. But the obvious option would be, be to, well, basically put a Dune skin on Planet Side 2. <laughs> huh, yeah. You've got, like, three factions fighting each other with weird different tech on each side. And again, this all has the limited biome problem, I'm sure. Right? But... Yeah, I feel like RTS was a good genre for Dune. Um, yeah, that last Westwood one yeah. was, was decent. Um, where was like, do you remember that one? The one that was sort of like three D yeah. graphics. Yeah, and, uh, yeah, yeah, like, like a one. kind of generals kind of engine but with a sort of meta layer. Yeah, you know, I mean, it wasn't like mission structured. It had like had like meta progression. A bit more XCOMy, I guess, but the missions were RTS. I'm just looking forward to the Dune sequel or, or part two, mainly because they cast Christopher Walken as the Padishah Emperor. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to see that. I, awesome. I just I, I need to relieve Gnome of her pain, of the frustration. Oh, yeah. The she didn't know going in that it was half a film. Well, <laughs> No, she didn't. Like, well, no. I, don't, I don't remember her doing. But even I went in it and thought that the ending was kind of in a bad place. And it's just like, ah, I got it. Yeah. Oh, well, mm. that's the thing. It's like, where do you cut it? Yeah. Um, it? It's quite faithful to the book, and it's like, yep, that's halfway through the story. <laughs> it's not really a. It's kind of a weird place to end. Yeah. Um, yeah. I don't know where else you could cut it because it's kind of everything before that is like 
you know, there's the setup and then there's the disaster, right? And then do you just end it there where it's a total failure, basically, apart from the fact that they got away? Or And then you had the encounter with the Fremen and he wins the fight. And it's like, well, at least that's something, right? Yeah, I, um, I think they could so have stopped the, it earlier. Like, uh, on the only just getting away and been like... But looking, that would have been... And just looking out and being like, oh, God. End. Oh, God. Yeah. <laughs> I guess they thought he needed a victory to end on or something, rather than it all being, like, Bad. you know, negative. Um, like just, just have this this inkling of hope but yeah i guess that was the idea but it's also a weird because that's the start of a chapter when he encounters the fremen right when mm. he has the has the fight and it's and it's like it's, i suppose it, i suppose it's supposed to be an intriguing cliffhanger but it didn't really work no. it, basically you need to do the two you need to do the whole thing <laughs> yeah. it will make sense later but it doesn't really work for like it's actually surprising how well going back to the lord of the rings like that's technically one book i know it's split into three volumes but it's actually it's one book and it's actually quite surprising how well fellowship of the ring the first volume works as a single movie mm. like this and not it's not a perfect ending but it's pretty obviously they added more to it because like they kind of embellished the stuff with boromir's death in a really good way like that's a really good scene that isn't in the book when he's talking to aragorn when he's dying or whatever I'm, but but they made it a good ending even though it's only it's not really the end of the book yeah to an extent i remember feeling better about fellowship of the ring having seen the trilogy yeah i mean that's like, inevitable when i saw of, it when yeah. i saw it on its own i didn't really you know when it when it first came out i wasn't really following the hype train right right yeah. like like i came out of that thinking like well it's clearly well made <laughs> you know yeah but, and, but that that being the overriding emotion like i wasn't like hooked on it or anything like that um and i met uh, yeah two towers i didn't i still haven't been managed to stay awake through um uh and uh and yeah with the return of the king with its many endings i did at least watch work watch through that and i thought yeah okay then i i, I did think actually think it came together if that makes sense but now, because yeah. I have that retrospect, I can go. I can go back to the first one, and I can. And I have watched it since, and been like, "Yeah, you know what? That actually does hang together. I get it." But, yeah. But like watching watching it the first time, it just did not sit. Um, it, it, was that it, partly it, because the ending was not an, a full ending? <laughs> I guess it. I don't know if there's enough though. of a because it is just a journey, and there was just a fight, <laughs> it's like a it fight and then they break up right like yeah, the team breaks up it didn't right? necessarily feel like a an it didn't really feel like an arc right like if you if you were to take take an anime like ten, generally the idea would be like to take an arc and turn that into a film well, it was also and just then like... and then you go to like the next uh, next arc is the next film and so on and so on yeah. and so on like uh, which is technically how like adaptations of anime have gone right i'm not saying they're good mm. but, I'm not sure I've come across one that is like, but really, that's really how good, I, but that's how they approach how they it. And, that, yeah, uh, sure. and, it, and it, you do come kind of way, come away feeling like, okay, that storyline has at least come to some sort of conclusion, uh, which didn't really feel like a thing. <laughs> it was also because like they, the end of the film basically just happens in the middle of nowhere. Like mm -hmm. if they'd got to a town and then there was a fight and then they yeah. split up departing from that town, sure. that would make it feel slightly more <laughs> of an right. arc. Which is kind of I mean, technically it is like an important hill yes, where they can see very far or something. <laughs> but <laughs> yeah. I mean yeah. They've just come past the big statues, you know. It's yeah, technically yeah. an important place. Yeah. But it's just a lake. But basically. it is just a place yeah. in the middle of nowhere, essentially. Yeah. It's true. Like perhaps it's just that feeling of knowing, like at the time, where it's just like I'm gonna have to wait another whole bloody year for this. Well, like, naturally. Whereas, like you know, if you're if nowadays you can go back and watch it and feel like, great, that's episode that's one true. done. I could probably and I, can, I can watch the next part whenever I want, and that doesn't feel so bad. Like, and that's where which, we are with Dune. I which guess. is exactly it's where like, we are with Dune. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I probably won't rewatch Dune until the second part comes out. No, I don't, I, don't think part. I don't think I'll yeah. find any enjoyment in that. <laughs> yeah. Honestly, other than to just marvel and this looks really nice. Like, I, th yeah. I, th I think that's all I'm going to get out of Dune. Like, yeah. Anyway, the Dune game. The Dune game. There's a Dune game coming. Um, what other games cons are there? Uh, anyone remember Lord of the Fallen? 
or no, was it called Lords or was it actually just called Lords of the Fallen? I think this was like at some point EA was trying to get in on uh, somewhere between ca- character action and like demon souls, and they made uh, they made uh, 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 something like that. Hey, it's getting a was it EA? It might not have even been here. Anyway, it's getting a sequel, and they slapped a the on the front of it, the Lords of the Fallen. <laughs> it's like. I mean, it had a nice fancy trailer, no gameplay, so can't make any judgments. But hey, in terms of uh, rumored sequels that are actually happening, there you go. You can have that one. The Lords of the Fallen. Uh, Moonbreaker is what I really want to talk about next, though, because that's a. That comes from the developers uh, of Zach, one of Zach's favorites, Subnautica. Oh, yeah. Uh, and they're going off in a completely different direction. <laughs> Which is apparently their thing. Um, I didn't know what, what they made to go before. off in, in yeah, different directions. Just go totally not be limited to genre. Which I, I, that's cool. Apparently, this isn't the first time they've done this. Like they made something before Subnautica, and I, I don't know what that was, but like it was totally different again. Um, uh, so yeah, the, the, this this time they are embracing the world of tabletop miniature games and are basically oh. making a yeah a sort of uh, team on team. Almost like a hero shooter, but in but in I guess in board game form, I suppose you pick your heroes and put them up against another team, um, in a in a in a fight of strategy. But they're really leaning into this miniature aspect and the the fact that it is kind of board game stylized in that like the characters aren't animated; <laughs> they're literally just like pieces on a board that maybe jiggle around a bit. And they've added then they've then added weapon graphics to there thing like the, the the statue itself never actually animates it just moves within the environment to represent things and uh to the point where they've gone hardcore on a painting engine so you can paint your own miniatures and uh like like just like warhammer and anything like that like they're, they're, they're going in they're going in hard and uh i don't know look like it might be good it's not an unusual concept, I would say. I'm sure there was a game quite recently that had a like board game ish aesthetic. I think it was more of a, it was like a board game Diablo kind of thing where you were, it was like generating dungeons automatically and then you just, but it was, it had that same style of aesthetic when like nothing was animated. It was just like board pieces moving around. Right. I mean, you could argue that games like, uh, Damn it, I've forgotten what it's called. But the one the one that I've played both of them of, like where you're like playing the dealer and it has like an right. overworld made of cards. Yes. God, what is that game called? Um But like that phase of it. You know, it had real time combat sections that had like Batman combat in it as well. Little, Slightly well, strangely. <laughs> yeah. That will um skip over a little bit. But was it like Hand of Evil or something? Oh, I can't remember. Uh still, still can't remember. Uh but the yeah you know, the the core aesthetic of the game was as you're looking at this this game play out in front of you, um, in real space, quote unquote. And arguably, just like a lot of the card based games are basically that, <laughs> like all the Slay the Spires and Darkest Dungeons and all those stuff. Sure, they don't exactly have much animation. <laughs> you're looking it up in your Steam library. Yeah, I'm just browsing my Steam library, talking about yourself. <laughs> I mean, I probably won't find it, but, <laughs> but, yeah, but yeah, I know what you mean. It's like not like the the board game realized idea is new. No, and also you know, you just play oh. tabletop simulator. <laughs> true, <laughs> play every That's board true. game ever. Yeah, <laughs> but and in fairness, neither was survival. You know, the survival game wasn't new when they no. made Subnautica. They just made a good one of those. Yes. Well, I mean. Yes, arguably you could say the thing that made some of the difference was that it was a survival game that actually also had a story. That was the thing. Hand of Fate was what I was thinking of. Yes. Manos. <laughs> the Hand not. of Fate. <laughs> <laughs> no? But never mind. That's my... <laughs> I watched too much Mystery Science Theater 3000. <laughs> okay. That's like a famous one of like a really bad movie, Manos the Hands of Fate. And it has like a really boring intro where nothing is happening apart from they're driving through fields. So they just have nothing to joke about. So they just keep re- repeating the name of the film over and over again. <laughs> Manos the Hands of Fate. 
Manos. Manos. <laughs> Much more manos. Is it like the extended cut <laughs> to the field? We really like this field. What? We had lo lots of field for today, yeah. so, we put, so we put it all in. Anyway, Moonbreaker. Pay attention. I think that's going in the early access real soon. So, um, uh, have a go. Um, new character action game alert that might actually have my attention. Uh, Atlas Fallen. Uh, again, no gameplay shown here, but the, the setup seemed nice and that it's, uh, you know, a little like a sandy planet where magic has left, but there are a few people that are magic wielders, uh, but the bad, the, the, the creatures, the bad stuff you're trying to protect caravans of trade against are made of sand and stuff. It looked pretty cool. It's getting heavily mm. advertised on YouTube. <laughs> I noticed that much. It's, it's like, it's one of my YouTube ads that now pops up almost every time. Um, <laughs> Is this game? Uh, yeah, I'd, again, hard to get a vibe from it because it's just a CG trailer. But I, I don't know. Some, something about this looked all right. Like it, it clicked a little with me. Um, mild surprise. Dead Island Two is actually a thing. Is that a mm. mild surprise? Well, because it's been hanging around for ages. Yeah, not the, quite ever coming out. The state of it has been so unknown for so long. Uh, so it turns out it was dead for a while. Uh, and uh, was totally resurrected by a brand new team because obviously Techland, who were working on it originally, well, I don't think they ever worked on it originally because I think that deal, I think they may have severed from the publisher to go make Dying Light before Dead Island 2 was in development, something like that. Anyway, it was messy back then. Hmm. Um, that thing's coming, not, not only coming out, it's they've given it a release date. Like it's coming out February 2023. That thing's nearly done. <laughs> I'm sure they were happy about the next thing on this list. <laughs> Goat Simulator 3. <laughs> Stealing their trailer. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Goat Simulator 3 looks like Goat Simulator. Yep. And that is no bad thing. No. I think Excellent. I'm, I think it's been... Long enough. I think it's been... Yeah, <laughs> it's been a, the correct amount of time since... It has to be pointed out, Goat Simulator. There was no Goat Simulator 2. <laughs> <laughs> it's part of the joke. Yeah, which is fantastic. Uh, and that's coming out real soon as well. Like, for realsies, not even early access. That's just coming out out. Enjoy. Uh, and we got a Sonic Frontiers trailer. And afterwards, <laughs> another one, which is... Oh, and uh, wait, what? A, a second one? I haven't seen this... Did you? No, I've seen. I've so, only seen the one they showed at Gamescom. They showed. I think so. The one they showed at Gamescom was the no O and L. Anyway, I don't uh, know if the what else they did. I would call it the like story trailer, I guess. Hmm. Because <laughs> we saw a bad guy of some description. Yes, and that looks. They said things to Sonic. <laughs> that looks a bit like Infinite from Sonic Forces. <laughs> yeah, slightly worrying. It's got yeah. that. It's got that weird purple digital effect uh -huh. that the Phantom Ruby had on, on things, which is not the best sign <laughs> is this is this actually like is this new person like infinite daughter or something or is, is this, this whole is, thing this whole thing is revenge quest? well this whole thing is a fake world created by the phantom ruby well, i mean possible <laughs> yep very possible but then, then the other trailer that they showed afterwards i believe was basically the first trailer they should ever show it's just like the overview trailer that just tells you about the actual game <laughs> oh, bloody, bloody hell really yep. oh okay Maybe I should watch that thing. Yes, it's just like a just just your typical narrated trailer talking about what you're going to be doing, and you know, here's with Sonic's new fighting system, you're going to be killing enemies and solving puzzles, and wait, he's wait. got the loop thing, and so it's it's like, it just it just tells you about the actual game. So is it the sort of trailer that would have been in Nintendo Direct? <laughs> yes, exactly. Right. What about it, Sonic? <laughs> Why? Got there, you IGN? Apparently, maybe. Yeah, whatever that. <laughs> deal was I, I, that must have been sega orchestrated you would assume so ign wouldn't have done that right well i mean i mean maybe they did ign would have asked to make some kind of deal for sure a tie-in and multiple tie multiple trailer things but who knows what the actual choices were but yes and then um, so again 
talking about that same situation these videos make it look much better yeah. than those original yeah the original IGN footage that we saw which i don't know that could be because these are trailers and it's like disguising it sure <laughs> which is very possible yep but we'll see i guess i think hype levels are marginally they higher are. yeah <laughs> So, Sonic Frontier's hype is building rather than decreasing, which is but then it's unusual. like it's, it's building from a massive low of those mm. first trailers. It's like it's coming so, back up to normal. So maybe this was the exact right strategy. <laughs> maybe. Well, I mean, if you if you imagine a situation where the they had these exact same trailers and they did show them the other way around, that'd be real bad. <laughs> yeah, that'd probably. be worse. Yeah. I mean, maybe. Or if you'd had because the... you'd still you'd have seen those initial trailers of the open world like on its own, and with no context that there was anything better, like but it, like, which is our problem, right? That, that we had a few months ago. But if like you did it the other way around, you'd have at least had the wait. But there's some other stuff that looks like traditional Sonic levels here that they're just not sure, showing. That have been a, the quality been like a of hope. it in those in the original trailers, the original in this universe trailers was <laughs> like that makes it look worse. You, and then you have more of a feeling that they were hiding it from the original trailer. Mm. Where it's just like, oh, this is what it's actually going to be like there. <laughs> maybe. Whereas in this situation, you could say, well, maybe those were really early footage. And it's actually going to be more like what these current trailers show. Yeah, we've seen biomes as well in the open world now. We've, well, seen, yeah. we've seen quite a lot of stuff. One thing that I'm still... And the end of this year is, is getting is getting packed for me at the moment, yeah, actually. Kind like, of. which is rare. Yeah. Like, I'm actually like possibly in on quite a lot of new releases this yep. year. The one thing that I find still the most worrying about it is just like, I mean, the cyberspace levels are clearly just reusing all of the ge- generations assets, and it's just like oh, that's so, the aud- so so lazy. We talked about this before, but the audio still mm. is out of place. The yeah. Dreamcast era audio. Is, is out of place. Which they haven't updated, yeah. Yeah. It really needs an overhaul. It's been 20 years, right? <laughs> yeah. That they've been using this audio style. Or nearly 20 years. So, you know, and uh, but, uh, of course. Oh, 20 years, I was, yeah, about that. Yeah. Of course, because, you know, we are on some level Sonic fans. It's just sure. like. We're, we're just like well it can't be as bad as frontiers so it's a plus in any case surely it forces you mean. oh yeah yeah sonic forces is a, is a definite low point <laughs> it can't be as bad as the previous games probably hopefully <laughs> hopefully but probably still never gonna be as good as generations no really depends on what these like little stages are like with me I'm sure the open world stuff's fine, but like, I want to know what the rerunnable stages are like. Hmm. Speaking of games Rob's not going to play this year. Oh, boy. <laughs> this is a bummer, but not entirely unexpected. Uh, What's fallen off? Bomb Rush Cyberfunk. Oh, no. Coming out this year. And it's not only been bumped a little bit, it's been bumped by pretty much a full year. Wow. Okay. So expect more. Although. Was a team reptile did said, look, we're, like we know this this sucks, but we are going to be showing more of it mm. in 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 between here and the gap. So, well, you know, as you'd expect, they want to show more of it before it comes out. Yep. But like, it yeah. explains why they haven't shown very much of it. They were like, yeah, we like we don't think it's there yet. They they were pretty like we like we just don't think it's there yet. We're going to bump it by a whole year, and uh, uh, but we'll be more frequent with our updates until, okay. until it comes out. Well, you know, better than rushing it, but that's quite, you know, dramatic. It's been in development for a while, so... It yeah. has been a little while since Lethal League Blaze. Um, yeah. But, hey, I don't care. Like, keep it cooking. If it's not yeah. ready yet, it's not ready yet. Make sure it's good. Yeah. I think they know what they're trying... <laughs> okay, there's not a huge amount of pressure, because honestly, how big is the JSR community? <laughs> but, st- but but still, I think there is there is they they're very definitely trying to go, to capture that legacy of JSR and the style of JSR but probably make it a game. <laughs> Which is, you know, a little harsh to JSR but still. Well, and yeah, fair. Yeah. Uh So, fair play. If you need if they, if it needs to keep cooking, cook it longer. Um I'm I'm, I'm happy to wait. My fantasy league isn't. Hmm. 
Well, but, I mean, save it for next year. Yeah, uh, <laughs> it's, on it's, it that's true. I can just add it to my list again next year. It's all good. I can't even drop it, though, because someone counterpicked it. Yep. It's like, it was a good counterpick. <laughs> I'll give you that. Also in the news, I spotted Rocksmith Plus, one of Zach's like, picks for the Fantasy League, is actually going to come out, and it's going to come out real soon. Wow. Okay. Oh, what's the latest on it, though? Is it? Does it look good or bad? Does it look Who good knows? or bad? I think I think the jury's still out. Like it all depends on the tech, right? With Rocksmith, that's yeah. kind of a problem. It's like it's all about their MIDI controller, and uh, you can't pre-review that one. No, <laughs> you got you got to try it. And now for the biggest upset, probably. Well. For us, like, for us yes, maybe, yeah. but not even really that. 343 Industries. There was a moment when Halo Infinite came out and everyone thought, hey, this is pretty good, that maybe they'd, uh, maybe they'd sorted stuff out at the studio and that things were, the ship was turning around from being a disappointment machine to a... <laughs> Genuinely, to an average to a genuinely <laughs> average developer. Yeah, <laughs> um, I'm not so sure. Personally, I'm not so sure that's the case because they have broken one of their promises. Kiki Wolfkill has said on stage that Halo Infinite was going to get split screen co op. Mm. This has been fully cancelled. It will not get Aww. split screen co op. Never ever. Nope. Nope. Sad times. So you can't complete your Halo run? Well, you know, I've never played Fire either. So. Yeah, because <laughs> oh, yeah, okay. that, have, that, that didn't out. either. No. Okay. So <laughs> it would have been an uncompletable run anyway, because they're never going to put that in. No, they've already, yeah, they've, they've already confirmed they're never going to go back and do five. Um, right. Is it? Is that just... It's such a shame, because like, I, I always had so much fun doing... doing not just between co-op in general, but but the Halo ones were really good, and it's like Absolutely. it's just not, just doesn't seem to be doable with modern games, or, no. they, or they just, yeah. I mean, Halo, Halo co-op, especially those first. Well, I was about to say first three, but first five. Yeah, actually, <laughs> the first, you know, because I mean, even four's okay in co-op. Yeah, it's okay, but like it's possibly the low point of the of the co-opable. Halo game, local locally co-opable Halo games. Um, yeah, it's a good time. It's a, it's a real good time. It's a real draw for me for the series, and it's um, uh, I kind of do want to play Halo Five again. I kind of because I've only really played it through once properly, and I kind of want to subject Zach to it. <laughs> but like, <laughs> it's it's that's a, a quite a difficult proposition for us to do without. Yeah, I don't know. I don't, I say that we could set that up. We could make that happen. Yes, we could. Um, but it's like it's a bit. It's quite a faff because um, we'd need two consoles and two setups and um, have that all rigged up to to do it. Because it's at least Halo Five launched with online co op. Um, Halo Infinite still doesn't have that. Like online co op, like has only been for a beta phase, hmm. um, and I think it was closed beta as well. I don't think it was like fully open. Um, so there's still nearly a year after launch, no co-op option available in in Halo Infinite. Um, it's a bummer, man. Then let alone the point that people are pissed off with what they're doing with the uh, the actual multiplayer side of the game, anyway. Because that was the other thing they said, like, "Oh yeah, and we're going to delay the the launch of season three by like." six months or something ridiculous hmm. so which i'm not sure actually means a whole whole bunch because they're still going to release a few new few more maps where they were when they were originally going to release them but it does mean that things like um forge um hmm. which is a which has been a massive feature of halo since halo 3 um sure. especially for the online community and people that get really into it it's a big deal um it's uh, that's not going to turn up uh in November, I think, when it was slated to come out. So that's that's going to be pushed way into next year. Um, and I think it's just it's just proven that whatever 343 are doing it, they can't do it quickly. They can't do... Their workflow is not fast. 
Um, mm. And this has been true, I think, since... Uh, I, I think it, it's just something about 343, right? The Master Chief Collection is the obvious ref- reference point, because that came out and was okay, but it took them a long time to write that ship. And it just, uh, yeah, it just gets the impression that 343 just can't turn themselves around very quickly to get get content into a game. They are not Fortnite, <laughs> and like no one is, honestly. So that's a bad reference point. But like they're not, I don't know. I feel like Deep Rock Galactic are putting out more more content quicker and doing a better job of it than theirs, and they're like a tiny studio in comparison. It's odd. It's it's just odd and disappointing. I wonder if they're a bit complacent because they're like this first part of Halo. Microsoft Studio and they're Halo. Yeah, I don't and, think I don't think they can be anymore. They just but, can't like like they can't rely on that anymore. The, in, they're they've way never, past that point. Most news things that come up are about Halo are negative, and they just have been for a long time. Yeah, they don't have much good. It's not like I mean, I feel like. From my perspective, I don't know, because I never played their, their games because I was kind of done with Halo after Bungie. But like, I feel like they, I played the Master Chief Collection and I feel like they did a good job putting that together eventually. Eventually, right? yeah. Eventually. And that's that's great. Um, but like in terms of the actual games that they produced, I, just, I'm just, I don't know. It seems to be. And we they still don't have, have much goodwill. And we still have to think that it, it t- took them, what, until earlier this year for them to go back and actually restore Halo 1 to original Xbox quality, right? It's, yeah but i mean it, they did it but they, yeah, they, they did go and do it and like honestly fair yeah. play to them they didn't have to like it was kind of okay but like they went back and did that stuff and like all credit to them but perhaps it should have been that out the door you know <laughs> mm. um yeah they have they mm, it just fifa 3 just seemed to take forever and like it's too long it's too long for the type of game they want to make or the type of service they wanted to run with Halo Infinite multiplayer, mm. and they're, yeah, they're just they're just not reactive enough. Boo to you. Maybe maybe I'll check in. It's been like friggin' ages since Boo I've played you. Halo Infinite, so like maybe I'll check mm. in and see what's going on with that um, with the multiplayer. There's still those unanswered rumors about. That hey, there were bits of that infinite map that were designed for DLC that hasn't yet happened. So uh, look forward to 2025 where we might <laughs> find out what that is. Right. That's the news. Right. That's the news. Oh, it's time for what you've been playing. Uh, let's start with Zach. Go on. What have you got? Go I know mean, I said this Go last on. week, and then it turned out to be not true. But I think I really don't have much to talk this week. That's all right. <laughs> all right. That's, That's all right. what I say every time. But, um, it's I, true. <laughs> I, I continue playing Oxford not included, and I've hit a, a, a one of those inflection points that I've talked about before, where I went from like too many people being idle to how, how everything's taking too long because everyone's doing too many jobs. Right. <laughs> where I just started building the well. As I said, like some of those things I was waiting to finish, like the Steam device, those finished, and I was like, "Well, let's build, let's build a new thing." But then I also ran into like, I guess I'd call it like another balance problem of the sort of late game of that because I, one of the things I chose to do was I did start like my fourth base on the radioactive asteroid with the idea of potentially getting uranium off it at some point. And water, I guess, because it has some actually good water output on its geysers or whatever so i was mm-hmm. like okay that's that this base makes enough sense that i'll go through the effort to establish an actual base here and have it be permanently occupied or whatever so i started doing that but then i kind of discovered the like the i guess it's a late game problem of balance with like infinite resources because the mid game version of infinite resources are all the geysers and volcanoes that just produce stuff infinitely and then, like, the problem of that is that they're usually, like, really hot. So you have to process it and get rid of all the heat and deal with that. But it is an infinite resource. So it just co- continuously outputs a certain amount. And that's guaranteed. Mm. But then the, like, late game version of infinite resources, for mostly for the more rare resources that don't have volcanoes that output them, is there's like locations in space that you can mine by equipping a, equipping a rocket with like a 
mining device basically so they are they are like they are like a real map you don't actually build a base on them or anything it's just a right you send a rocket to this location and then you just get resources from it and those are also technically infinite so they they just regenerate over time but it's like mm -hmm. it's the more expensive version of infinite because you're having to pay for all this stuff you're having to pay for rocket fuel to get the rocket out there you're having to pay for the food to keep the pilot alive this whole time you're having to pay to make diamonds to run the drill because the drill uses up diamonds as it runs <laughs> so it, it, it is an infinite source of resources but not without a cost but then you know at a certain point it's, it's like you need diamonds to run this drill but there's a there's a, not a location in space where you can mine diamonds but there is a location in space where you can mine carbon which you can then turn into diamonds essentially for free it's like it uses power and radiation but that, those are both infinite resources in themselves essentially so yes you technically diamonds are an infinite resource <laughs> if you just mine the infinite source of carbon and then turn it into diamonds so but then the trouble with that was like so I just started setting up this new base on the on the radioactive asteroid to potentially mine out the uranium and bring it wherever I want to build a reactor at some point in the future, and maybe also exploit the the weird like radioactive bees that can process the uranium for free, essentially. I was like, okay. <laughs> radioactive bees. Yeah. So I was like, okay, that's a good good enough reason. To Is that this. how you refine the uranium after all? Well, like, it's we one of about these centrifuges. Well, it's, it's, it's all about what, bees. It's the typical oxygen not included thing of like. You can build a centrifuge and just put the uranium in there and get the rich uranium out yeah. at the cost of yeah. like a ton of power and heat or whatever. Or you can yeah. like you can take control of these bee these bees and like they they are obviously they process it much slower and it obviously doesn't right. make any heat or anything. It's just sort of inconvenient because you have to deal with managing these bees or whatever. But it's actually more efficient. Like you get more uranium out of it than you do ultimately from doing the centrifuge method. <laughs> so i was like yeah i could totally do that but then okay. while i was waiting for that base to start getting built i was like well i've got these other rockets that aren't really doing anything so maybe i'll start sending out like scout missions to see if i can find the other asteroids i haven't found yet or other space mining locations and yeah. one of the ones i found is just a place where you can just send a rocket to mine uranium i was like oh, <laughs> oh. <laughs> i guess i don't need to worry about this entire base i've got an infinite source of uranium now because the uranium on that planet is even infinite. Like, it, you know, it's just a regular map. I could mine out all the uranium off that planet eventually. Hmm. Whereas in this space location, I just send a rocket out there for like 20 days and then come back with however much percentage of the uranium output it would be. It'd be like, I don't know, two tons or something. I don't know how... I don't, don't, I, I don't know the maths of how much, how long that would actually last in a reactor. I think quite a long time because I, if I remember my like experiment I did with the reactor in my previous save... And, you know, in a kind of realistic way, you feed a very tiny amount of uranium into the reactor and it makes a shit ton of heat. <laughs> but yeah, so I found that and I was like, oh, well. But luckily I did also find a mineable space location where I could get one of the components for supercoolant, which is why I'm now in the process of building like a massive like hydrogen cooler to make the liquid hydrogen because now I actually have the stuff I need to make the super coolant to be able to do that. So that gave me a new project to actually build on my main base where I had that infinite hydrogen storage, mm. the door compressor. I was like, I can actually finally <laughs> use that. <laughs> <laughs> Although then again, it's like, I'm not sure what I'm even going to do with the rockets that come from that. I guess go and send them to mine. Well, the funny thing is I also found a place where I can send a rocket to mine hydrogen. So I could use the hydrogen I already have to to compress into liquid hydrogen and use that to fuel a rocket to go and mine more hydrogen so it can essentially fuel itself. <laughs> Pointless journey. Well, I mean, it will fuel itself and then some, mm. so I can run, like, more rockets. That would be, like, the supply rockets, kind of. But that's the thing about the late game of space mining is it it, it, it takes a very long time and it is technically very profitable, but then it's just like, again, I'm running into the same situation. I'm like, but do I need to do that really? <laughs> I could go and get a shit ton of hydrogen, but I've already got this infinite door compressor amount, and I don't really know what else I'm going to use these rockets for, especially not from main base. Because, well, it's weird because like the main base is sort of in the middle of the map. It's not exactly in the middle of the map. 
and the maximum range range of rockets will more or less get you to the edge of the map from the center. But it's obviously, you know, if you're trying to save fuel, launch from one of your other bases, which is further out and closer to the thing you're going to. And also, as I said before, my main base doesn't really have useful resources for rockets. It has this it, this giant, like, compressed bunch of hydrogen that I've just been sitting on forever. But that if I use that up, it's not going to be produced at a rate that's actually useful it's it's only there's only tons of it there because it's been there the whole game right. <laughs> like 800 cycles i've just building building up this pile of hydrogen but it's not going to keep up with a rocket program or anything right i see whereas like one of the the second asteroid that has those radioactive satellites on it so you can power a radioactive rocket that's way faster like i can refill a rocket off that much quicker than i will theoretically be able to with this slow rate of hydrogen so I don't know. The rocket program continues to be weirdly kind of pointless. <laughs> I mean, I think theoretically I could kind of just finish the game as much as you can finish that game, hit the end goal, because I've already found the planet that has the device that you have to activate to to go to the end to finish the game. Uh, but I haven't found the object in space that you also need to find that that object targets hmm. it's basically like it has to shoot a beam into this other thing in space but you have to find it so i haven't done enough scouting with my other rockets to find where that is right, yet i see but theoretically i could just go to the place where that thing is and set up a base to power it up maybe except i don't know Again, the classic problem with this game is it doesn't actually tell you everything about everything it has a lot of information but it's just like it's this. It's a building, and it's like you have to power this up to finish the game. And it tells you it requires rad bolts, so you have to funnel radiation into it. But it doesn't tell you how much. Mm. <laughs> so I don't actually. I don't know how much effort that would be. Would I have to build a reactor Does to make just, enough radiation sure. to run that thing? Does it just suddenly go ping? Yep, you get. You've done it. Yeah, I mean, presumably it will. And weirdly, like from as what I understand of how the end game actually works, it's like. It's like weirdly inconvenient to keep playing after the end game. Cause like it's, you know, it's not really, it doesn't really end the game as all of these games don't like Factorio sure. or whatever, launching the rocket. Mm. But as far as I understand it in this, in this DLC, when you trigger this end game event, it like turns on meteor showers as, as the base game had. Oh, I see. Right. Cause the base game had meteor showers where like the surface of the asteroid is like, Every now and then, a bunch of meteors yeah, yeah. come down and hit it, so you have to have like bunker doors to protect your stuff. Yeah, and it's really inconvenient, really inconvenient, kind of. But then in the space out DLC, because they made the rocket rockets more important to the whole progress of the game, they basically remove the meteor showers to make it much easier to deal with having rockets, a rocket pad yeah. and just having them exposed. But then when you trigger this thing that ends the game, it turns the meteor showers back on. And that's just going to suck. Because all your bases where you've got these completely exposed rockets, you'll just be like, well, now I have to build all the infrastructure to protect them. <laughs> and do it now. And do it immediately. Mm. So, yeah, it seems like that's kind of a weird... It's like you can continue after you've triggered this thing, but why would you want to? <laughs> Either just don't trigger it and just play the game forever or trigger it and start a new game, I guess. You're done here. Yeah. <laughs> and there was a slightly strange announcement recently in, in the news feed for Oxy Not Included where they've announced that they're they're not going to make any more DLCs. They're just going to go back to normal updates like they do in every other play game where okay. they just update it and you just get the stuff for free. Right. Like okay. they've decided that they don't want to have DLC be, be a thing, I guess, which is a slightly weird odd. business decision, but yeah. I mean, it's good for players. <laughs> yeah, definitely. But yeah, slightly odd choice for them. Also, it's basically if they're just going to keep working on this game for much longer. Yeah, exactly. I, I don't, mean, I don't, don't get me wrong. Don't Starve had quite the yeah, quite hell, the long cycle. It has continued even to this day. Really? Yes. Or well, the multiplayer version of Don't Starve. Gotcha. Oh yeah, which they did release as a separate. Yes, thing, it right? is a separate yeah. game. With complete, with, with like, it is more or less completely different to the base game now you can okay. still play the base game all the way through but then like the multiplayer version has a sort of an extension to it it's basically an expansion hmm. but you can also play through multiplayer <laughs> fair enough and, and then that game itself also has expansions which are 
our DLC, I believe. Oh, I see. Like the the seafaring one, I believe is the actual DLC. But yeah, they've now said that for auction not included, they're just going to go back to regular updates, which also makes it kind of weird for the DLC because part of the problem with the regular updates after the DLC came out was that like you have to account for both versions the base game version and the DLC version because of the way the balance is shifted. Yeah. Changing anything in one of those is going to affect Maybe both. that's why they don't want to make any more DLC because it's just like... Because it would be even we'll harder to keep track of the balance we'll between all these a, different systems. Yeah, we'll introduce a third balance pass we have to do. Yeah, maybe. But, but unfortunately, they've already created this one which is going to inconvenience them forever. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Unless they just literally decide to get rid of the DLC. Or just yep. like literally integrate it into the base game. That'll piss, piss off everyone who, yeah, bought, who the bought the DLC. It, yeah. but, you know. Well, if enough time passes, then sure, that's probably fine. Like it's not been unheard of in yeah. other games. Yeah. Um but like, yeah, you've got to give it some time for that to happen. Or they literally just stop. Like the updates don't apply to space mode. Mm, yeah, but Space Mode is the better mode, I would say, <laughs> okay. out of the two. I think you have to. Uh, Space Mode is the is a better version of that game, mm. I would say, in the long term. In the short term, it's basically the same. It's like if you're only going to play play a base for like twenty hours, you're not really going to notice much <laughs> difference. <laughs> Which is still a bad concept for me. So there's that. Um, I played some more Breath of the Wild, I guess. No power yeah, cuts, yeah, yeah. but I just continued. Because, god damn it, that game is so good. <laughs> yeah. That is the best game. <laughs> even though, it's the best game. Even though I just know everything. And I'm like, as soon as I walk into a shrine, I'm like, oh yeah, I know what I have to do. <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> oh, really... you've actually... Because there's like a... I, I'd forgotten a lot when I played it again of the 120 shrines or whatever. There was a few I had to resolve. Well, I mean, sure. I suppose... Technically, you could say I remember all the ones in the sort of in in the like zone that you're naturally going to travel. Maybe some of yeah, the further out yeah, ones yeah, yeah. I'm going to be less familiar with. Yeah, I'm sort of there, the de- there definitely are slightly to too many tests of strength on there. Yes, they are. <laughs> you need a few more puzzles in there, but yeah, maybe sure. the next one. Yeah, I was just saying, I'm getting to the point where I might want to play it again, but yeah. the knowledge that I would spend over a hundred hours on it is a little too much. I mean. You would. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know. Let's do it. Yeah, <laughs> It's a good way to spend those hours. I mean, you won't even realise it's playing video games. <laughs> I mean, yeah. come next year, there may be... Or maybe I could... Yeah, maybe there'll be the necessity to have something I can just pick up. Yeah, but then you have the sequel. <laughs> yeah, then I'll have the sequel. That's true. Well, presumably, if you want to. Yeah. Well, yeah, because I never finished the damn first one. Yeah, exactly. Too much to do. That's true. That is big. one advantage of, I suppose that's true of all the new consoles, but like you can pause them and resume them very quickly yeah. <laughs> when when needed, um, when having to take care of things. Templates. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <Stop it. laughs> there was that. Um, I finished the grind in Dirk. Oh, wow. Okay. Finished season two with plenty of time because they haven't even announced when season three. Well, they vaguely said it's, Q4. Yeah. <laughs> so, which which Q4, right? Like, is it financial Q4 or actual year Q4? Like, they didn't make that clear. Like, so I'm assuming December. Yeah, pretty much. And then, yes, I, I had already finished the grind in Rocket League, which Rob has not finished. Nope. And I'm desperately, it's got like two days left and I'm desperately trying to get, I've got like five levels left at this point. I managed to get another level this morning in the brief amount I was allowed to play it. <laughs> um, so it's like, yeah, that, mm, it's getting close. I need one. <laughs> Once again, assists have been the bane of my existence in that game. Yep. I, just, I just don't get that many assists. And uh, I have one more assist I need still, and that'll be all of the challenges done. And that means that means there's nothing but pure grind left to get those levels, which means I'm probably not going to make it. Horse! <laughs> there's literally a horse going through a fast horse house. As, as Robin talked about there not being any. It's not the Rosas, it's not Mounted Police. <laughs> well, no. <laughs> that only happens in the city. <laughs> I think this is my window is open, so I hope they heard that. Like, it's just, just a horse. Horse! Um, horse. 
And I think that's more or less all I did, except for now we... You, if you thought that we were going to be lacking a segue from for us completing Age of Calamity on the last podcast, and we wouldn't be able to use that as the convenient segue between me and Rob and I, like, you're wrong! <laughs> and here's Rob to tell you why. <laughs> and also about the ridiculous story of this. Sure. <laughs> uh, yeah, so we were going to stop playing Age of Calamity, having 100%ed it. <laughs> yeah. And... Uh, Instead of going into the DLC immediately, go off and play uh, Horrible Warriors Definitive Edition. Because Rob hmm. had it. I had already I had bought it. it. I, had a, I had a box of it Except on my shelf. <laughs> uh, so it got to the point where I'm trying to put it in my Switch. And uh, I, put, I take the cartridge out of the box. I put Age of Calamity to one side. I put the take the cartridge out of the box, put it in the Switch, and it goes... I don't recognize this cartridge. And I'm like, all right, okay. The Switch does that sometimes. Ooh, yeah, it just does that. It's just like, it's fine, it's fine. We'll just take it out and put it back in again. And then it goes, all right, cool, I got this. But on screen, it still says Age of Calamity. And I'm like, what do you mean you've got this? Like, <laughs> it's like, that's not the right That's not the right game. So I take the cartridge out and, have, and put it down next to the other cartridge that I've just taken. It's like, it's the, the same. fucking same cartridge. <laughs> So I'd basically been sold a copy of Hyrule's, Hyrule Warriors Definitive Edition with the wrong damn cartridge in the box. Yep. Oh no. <laughs> so, damn it. so we haven't got a copy of that. And I'm yet to source a copy of that at a decent price. How um, likely is that? <laughs> it's, so, I mean, it's the really store, obvious why, right? I mean, because it's the, the way Hyrule, those stores work. Because it's Hyrule Warriors. Yeah, right. I got it from yes. CES. Right, right, right. Like, oh, uh, I see. So, okay, so it, was, it, was a, uh, it was a trade-in. Uh, it wasn't a okay. brand new copy right. because those are right. like, that impossible to find. So the cartridge wouldn't yeah, have course. been in the box in the store and then someone would have looked at a label and only seen the Hyrule Warriors and not the whole thing. I mean, the story gets better. I took it back to CEX and they were like, yeah, fine, we'll sort this out. But when the guys behind the counter were talking to each other, they were like, wait, is this... Oh, is this the way? Oh, that's what happened. Right. They, were, they suddenly had this realisation. It's like, oh, right, that's happened. And then someone, someone else joined else. the conversation and they were like, Oh, was this the thing that happened? Like, not even. This is another one. So this isn't even the oh, first time before. they've done this. <laughs> they were just like, "Oh, it's happened again." <laughs> Retail fools, fools. It also meant they didn't have a, have the actual cartridge. They well, wanted. Naturally. Yeah, someone got a free copy of the film just when they wanted clarity. Uh huh. <laughs> Which. From if well or or not even maybe the wrong cartridge was always in that case. Well, maybe maybe it was traded in wrong. And yeah, they never noticed, and they didn't notice. Yeah, because it's like those cartridges are tiny, and it like the word the words "Age of Calamity" are super small yes. on that cartridge. But the that you know one is white, one is black. I like if you know, you know. Yes. But like if you're just working behind the counter, fair play. Like super easy mistake to make. Um. I mean, didn't but, it does mean, but it does mean we don't have it. So, uh, in my annoyance, I bought the DLC. <laughs> uh, for Age of Calamity. <laughs> Rage Fair. Fair. Yeah. So, we, uh, so, we, so we we're back to Age of Calamity. We're, back, we're still playing it, yeah. 130 hours in and we're still playing. <laughs> uh, yeah. So, um, I don't quite know what, what was what of the content we're playing was Wave 1 or Wave 2. I think, like, the main... The wave two stuff of the DLC was like there's 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 some new main story missions like or story ish missions added to it right yeah um, and the game very clearly labels everything as EX so you know what was DLC and what what isn't mm. um, we've already unlocked a new weapon we've got Lynx Flail um, which is weird as most of the weapons are because well, because it doesn't even seem to be that much about the flail no it's it's like its whole deal is that it's like it's a it's a flail made from like robot parts or like like guardian Very parts vague. and uh but it also copies weapons so it's like when you hook it to someone like a you know someone just wielding a sword and shield it suddenly becomes light link's sword and shield weapon um mm. Uh, and starts behaving a little bit like that in terms of the attacks you do. So what I'm now really interested in is just like, okay, how deep does that rabbit hole go? What, how weird does this get? Like, what can I copy? What don't I? What can't I copy? And 
It's probably not that weird. It's probably not that weird. It's probably just no. all the normal weapons that you can get. It, yeah, it's probably annoyingly just Link's set as yep. well, right? It's probably not like a bit like how weird it would be if I pull a bow and arrow out of one of those Bacobdans of bows and then it's just like or if you're fighting, suddenly you become Rivali. <laughs> yeah, or if you're fighting Rivali and you try yeah, yeah, to yeah. his weapon directly. Yeah, <laughs> weird stuff like that. And the copied weapons like gain a power boost over your base flail. So it's like, why would you use the base flail? <laughs> like, even though it has its own weapon set, it's like... It's a strange, it's a strange thing, but uh, hey, it's another another move set to to figure out. Another um, move set to buy every upgrade for as they appear on the map. Yep. <laughs> Meaning we have to earn all the materials for those upgrades, yep. of which there are new materials. <laughs> Meaning there's more stuff for us to do. Um, it also introduces the vicious monster fights, which are supposed to be like super hard encounters. Um, there's variants on the boss characters as well, like the bomb bomb moblin yeah. right he's annoying yep <laughs> silver moblins that just throw bomb barrels at you yeah they're quite <laughs> frustrating to fight well, well the, the trouble I, mean, is... I guess we just haven't found a tactic for them well, right yeah. sure i think the trouble with them is that like it's not really a weapon as such it's a physics object yeah which can, can really fuck everything up it just explodes <laughs> it can just explode in their face or they can throw it and it doesn't explode and it just sits there like a landmine yeah or you can throw your bomb at them as they're throwing their bomb, and their own bomb explosion breaks their armor <laughs> because right. it does the flame bomb effect, so it counts as a flame attack. Mm-hmm. So it gives you like the double armor break that the rods would. Yes, it's yeah. just like it's a chaos. Yeah, enemy. It's, it's not very easy to manage. No, especially if there's one of them mixed in with a bunch of other enemies. And we've already fought against a couple of big chews. Yep. Um. So they're. they're- they're they're kind of okay, but they're kind like, of okay. Except, of course, the obvious problem with fighting a giant blob is that you can't. They don't really have very much of a tell for any of their attacks. Yeah, <laughs> and the the range of their hitboxing can sometimes be a little tricky to fathom. Yeah, and they basically just throw miniature chews at you, which is also kind of annoying because they kind of then explode with like an area AOE as well. Yes. Um. So you got yeah. They're, hey, the game's throwing new challenges at us. I was I sort of almost wasn't expecting there to be these new enemies to to be like actually have new attack patterns and things mm. like that i kind of was sort of expecting them to be like another reskin of like like kind of like the base game did with like hinoxes and things like that apparently those are there too okay. so we'll have new variants of those to fight um but there is there is more to these bad guys than i was kind of anticipating it's so far not we've only done one of these vicious missions but the actual vicious enemy at the end is just like a oh it's just hard, like a line it's just a hard line yeah and it doesn't even which at this point is like ah that's nothing right. we're used to these oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> or, uh, and the only real difference seems to be just it has like way more health it's, it's not, oh got, yeah it was a lot of health yeah <laughs> it's got tons of health and it doesn't seem to do anything different no it was just a so it was just a much longer fight <laughs> And, the, and we haven't really un- actually unlocked like any of the new characters yet. Oh, no. um, so uh, you know, there's, there's stuff to stuff to enjoy here that we just haven't got to. Some of it, the vicious monsters thing seems a little weird because it seems like a rotating set of missions as well. Yeah, it's kind they, of like they the change. Blood yeah, <clears throat> they come and go. And should we need to do a bit of grind for materials at some point? The game's got us covered because there's an e- there's an even harder difficulty level added so we've been playing the whole thing through in the hardest difficulty available to us which is now no longer the hardest difficulty level available to us because they've added another one right which they've called apocalyptic difficulty <laughs> amazing <laughs> have you tried it at all do you no, know how no, much not, worse it not, is not yet not yet i was tempted to perhaps get, have, have a do a solo run and on on an, on an apocalyptic level but i like every time i've said that i've not quite gone back and done it <laughs> done a solo run um, i mean technically we Technically, we don't actually know how much harder very hard is than any other ones because we've never played them. <laughs> well, we sort of we did, did in right? the demo. Yeah, but right in the early days, we played through all the difficulty levels and we're like, actually, you know what? Very hard is probably the way to play this. Um, hence why we stuck to it. But yes, we definitely don't know. We don't have enough context to what the actual scaling is. Like, is it more enemies? No. Are the enemies just higher level? Do they just have more health? Well, we know they hit harder. Well, yes, that's the one thing that you you would definitely very clear yeah because like at the very start of a very hard playthrough you can only take two hits well you can't take two hits you take one hit the second one's going to kill you yeah (laughs) Hyrule Warriors yep 
look Pirate forward to Warriors. even more of it. <laughs> it's been like nearly a... You when did we escape. start playing this? It's been a really long time now. Um. <laughs> uh, right. What else have you been playing? Well, we're on the Switch front then. Yeah. Let's talk about Splatoon 3. Yes. Ah. Uh, the demo. The uh, Splatfest premiere oh. <laughs> happened last weekend. And uh, I'm trying to think where to begin with Splatoon 3. <laughs> because good news, it's still Splatoon. <laughs> and, it's still, okay. and it's still addictive as hell. And I still could not put the controller down. Uh, yeah, I, I pretty much spent all my available time with this thing. Uh, it's it's still Splatoon. I'm still, I still had a fantastic time with it. Um, so the the premiere was quite generous in the sense that it um, had quite a lot of maps on rotation uh, to answer our previous questions. Yes, it still works by the old map rotation system. It is a two map. Mm. Um, uh, Turf War operates on a two map system that changes every hour um, on the hour. That hasn't that remains remains identical. Um, whether you like it or not. Mm. Mm-hmm. Uh, the they had at least they had one variant of every single weapon uh, type available to you, which is an interesting concept because some of the weapon types are sort of similar, right? So they had the paintbrush from Splatoon Two, but they also had the Octo paintbrush, right? And the roller and the Dynamo roller, the, the rollers that are significantly different. What they didn't throw in were like the branded versions of those that mixed up your side weapons and special weapons. Right. Those mm-hmm. combos weren't available here. Which I hope come back because I didn't really find a set because they've mixed up the sets, right? The the, we- the base weapon sets don't have the same sides they used to. They don't have the same specials they used to. They've done the same thing they right. did between Splatoon 1 and 2 and that they've mixed up all the sets. And uh I didn't quite land on one that I was 100% happy with. The combo mm. I used to use from Splatoon 2 wasn't available, so like I couldn't that I couldn't do that. Um which for the record was the splat doolies with the tentatech missiles. Love those things. Uh <laughs> so that didn't that didn't really that that combo wasn't there for me. Um uh, but still, like I guess because it was the demo and because it just threw everything in and because the demo was operating under a... No, none of this really matters. None of your progress here is going to carry over into the full game. I was just like, well, screw it then. I'm going to try everything and uh, and have a, just just play around with it and see what, see what I like, see what I don't like. So uh, the new weapon types were there as well. So the Splatana was there, which is um, a very focused katana like weapon that draws a straight line of of goop right in front of your character so you have to be real precise to hit anyone with it and like and you can charge it which is a very quick charge and if you get right mm. up close to someone it's a one hit kill if you land it so it's brutal um i only came across one person trying it who seemed effective with it everyone else was rubbish at it because <laughs> i guess it's new but i had a go and i was rubbish at it um uh but it seems all right. It seems like a pro tier kind of weapon, if that makes sense. If you're like, kind of yeah, like how the sniper sure. rifles were kind of pro tier. Yeah, the they were pretty pro. Yeah, yeah. You have you had to aim, you have to aim good. Um, uh, also new is the oh, it's the tri cut. Is it called the tri cast or the tri splatter or something like that? It's a crossbow, but it fires like three arrows at once in a sort of in a in a fan, and you can um, if you do like a, a weaker shot, the fan is wider but lower range, and if you like charge it up and you can you can get a longer shot and the arrows are closer together but they're not just arrows they land and they don't do much in the way of paint damage or anything like that but then they also have like this little but they're basically a little delayed explosive that lands on the floor and then splats Mm. which is if you come across someone who's good at that that is really bloody annoying (laughs) because they'll like they'll just put a shot behind you timing timing when it's gonna yeah because they'll put a shot behind you you won't notice like you'll get into a fight with something else and then the explosion of these of this of this shot goes off behind you and kills you and you're like ah damn it i didn't see that um yeah i'm in the right hands that thing is going to be a nightmare to fight against um right again I was rubbish at it. <laughs> I could not could not figure out how to use that thing well. Um, but they seemed like good additions. I didn't mind, you know. I do not mind their presence. 
uh, what I did have a good time with is I I messed around more with weapons that I really sort of just sort of didn't in Splatoon Two, which was shame on me. Really, I spent more time like with the brush of all things, which was one of my worst weapons from um, from the previous games, and uh, had a blast with it. Actually, I was like, it was it was great. Get my brush down. Oh, slapping excellent. people in the what? face with a paintbrush is it mechanically different then or is it you're just uh, enjoying it more no it's pretty much it's pretty much identical um but for some reason i just found my ribbon with it this time um i mean potentially helped by everyone being on average worse yeah probably probably <laughs> because the game's like like you know about to come out it's in the hype cycle it's mm. a demo anyone can play it yeah maybe the mm. average of players is a little lower than normal um but uh, yeah, I had a real, real fun time messing around with that thing. Um, also, <laughs> had a good time using the splatling cannons, which is something I only used occasionally back in the day. Like, got out, brought out the heavy splatling, and I was having a whale of a time, just going, Rah, get to the chopper. <laughs> I got to say, with this huge mini yeah, gun like thing. Yeah. Uh, yeah, had a real good time with it. Um, so, Turf War wasn't the only thing you could play here. They also let you toy around with the in the second half of the Splatfest, the tricolor battle was open which is the new thing this time round uh which had so the Splatfest rules normally go like you're voting on your teams right and there's like uh however the battles go for one team just terms who's who's winning and stuff like that if you win more teams win more games while playing for team rock paper or scissors as it was in this case then uh whatever you you get it uh paper was yeah, winning yeah. by the halfway point um so in the tricolor w- fights they made up a team of four that always spawned in the start in the middle of this special level and it was as far as i can tell it wasn't one of the levels under normal rotation this was a level four this um it didn't i, I can't tell if it was going to be like splatoon 2 and that these levels were going to be like marina's special octo creations mm. and thus mm. be weird levels it didn't seem like that much of a weird level um uh but it did seem special for this mode um so yeah they spawn in the middle of the map and then at the same time to- two teams of two on either side of them are coming in in a sort of pincer action which at first we couldn't quite figure out how that was going to work, right? Because it seems like a bit of a weird imbalance still. How does one team still get four players and the other two still get two? How do you win this thing? Yeah. In reality, it still seems it seems to actually kind of work. It I, it feels like maybe the guys in the middle have actually just got too much to worry about. Um, with when there's two team when there's two other teams coming at them and surrounding them the whole time, mm. so they don't actually really. Uh, yeah, it, it, it seems to be balanced quite well. In addition, there's an extra mechanic where, like, if you can get to the middle of the level and hold a point down for mm. um, not very long, only a few seconds, but you have to be on that point and you're unable to act whilst on that point. You're, like, holding a thing up in the air. It's a little bit like the S flag from Smash Brothers, <laughs> right? You have to be there and just hold it above your head for a bit. Then mm. that will unlock what they call the Ultra Signal, which summons in like a constant shower of rain of your color on a on a sort of moving target around the level, making it even harder for the middle team. The middle team don't have access to this. The middle team have to defend this from the other two teams, mm. and mm. both of the other two teams are able to get it. So once our team's got it, for instance, we can't get it again, but the other team can still have a go. Um, so the odds are actually quite fair as it works out Hmm. surprisingly um and the matches were quite close often and it focuses a lot of the action on the middle of the map which is cool um okay that's cool through through the design yeah yeah so uh i i I think it works i think it's a good i think it's a nice addition um what I would say is, though, is that it's, it's like it's almost impossible to get a feel for how any of the other edi- additions and changes to the game really are going to make a difference here uh, from the trial. From, from the, the trial, oh, yeah, because they didn't really yeah. show off any of the um, none of the locker systems seemed to be there. Or at least I didn't find it. You obviously couldn't engage with any of the food systems that were before. All the stores were shut. None of the leveling mm. up systems were in play, so none of that really panned out. But I think all of that is the same. Like I don't mm. think there's any real meaningful changes there. 
Um, what you do get a feel for a little bit is like how the actual match making works. And that's kind of important, right? Because Splatoon's always been weird with this stuff. And despite the new set dressing of it having a lobby that you're in uh, whilst matchmaking, I don't think actually too much has really changed. No. Um, the lobby just gives you the ability to run around and shoot at some test targets with your current loadout. You cannot mm. change your loadout once you've started matchmaking. That's still true. Um, and it still has the odd at the end of each match. It's like, do you want to carry on with this loadout? Do you want to edit your loadout and continue or just stop? Which is weird because the do you want to edit your loadout and continue option gives you 30 seconds to mess with your loadout and then just chucks you into matchmaking again. Presumably to keep whatever lobby you've got partied up together. Hmm. But I couldn't get a feel for how that worked either because it seemed like... I don't, maybe that was the bit that wasn't working quite right because it feels like sometimes when you come out of a match you'd end up in the lobby with one or more of the players that came with you and maybe those are the guys that picked yes in that post match option but they would mm. and and you'd see a hologram of them hanging out in the lobby with you um but it seemed like it seemed pretty random whether or not they would stay with you or not like uh, i couldn't couldn't get a feel for that at all um but it also has like the obvious downside is is that thing we were talking about before where if you're wor- if you're one of these people that actually might be worried about team balance uh and you don't want too many snipers ending up on the same team, you are shit out of luck. Mm. Um, that is not a thing you can deal with here because you can't see your team's loadout and adjust it whilst you're matchmaking. It's not right, a thing. Just can't. I mean, they could have learned from things like multiverses, which I should perhaps talk about at some point, um, where they actually do have a brief phase where you can modify your setup based on what your teammate has just chosen to do or something like that it's like you know, i think that's a missing component here and it probably has been since the beginning of splatoon and they still haven't nailed that here like why can't i change my loadout while i'm matchmaking what does that matter is it really that much of a strain for the for the game to load content in a timely fashion if i change it last right. minute yeah. um so that's a little disappointing um I do think that having something to do in the lobby just in general is an improvement. Like the fact yeah. that I can muck, muck around with my loadout and just shoot at stationary targets, that's fine. That is something, at least. I kind of wish yeah, no. there was a way to do the, the mini games that Splatoon 1 had. Like, like I still wish they would return to that idea. Oh, um, yeah. Um, so yeah, uh, the, the lobby is not a huge improvement. They also like weirdly... like. The loadout picker that they meant, the thing where you can actually set five different set loadouts and just quickly recall them. Uh, I didn't find that at first. It's like it's not actually super obvious where that where that was, but it, but it is but it is there, um, and that is a welcome imp- improvement. Um, it is nice to be able to just go. No, I fancy just swapping to my dooley's setup for a game, and like swapping it, and it will change your weaponry and your clothing to match and things like that. So it's. Um, that is nice. Thank heavens that's back. Mm. So that's really all you got to saw. You get to wander around Splatsville whilst a Splatfest is on. So you get to see it in its night finery, I suppose. Um, and those concerns we had from the like the footage they showed are not a thing. But the animation stuff is only slow, low frame rate at a distance. I mean, it's there, but it is low frame rate at a distance. The shots they clearly right. picked for that footage in the in the direct were just a camera angle doing weird stuff. Oh, probably, that was just bad luck. Kind yeah, of. probably off position where it, where the center point is. So the oh, the, the stuff was animating low frame rate where the camera so was, not where the real camera was. If you see what I mean, the gameplay camera. Yeah. Yeah. So that that whole pr- thing is masked way better in game than it is than it was in that footage. Um. So that's good. Um, and of course, as usual, it ran at performance was perfect. Ran at a nice solid 60 all times. Um, I only had a couple of cases, no worse than the previous games, where connection just didn't succeed on matchmaking and it would just bomb out and go, you need to start this again. Um, that seems to have been a problem in all of the games. That's not, nothing that seems to have changed there. Uh I didn't encounter any significant lag during gameplay that I noticed, so that's good too. 
that, well, that's good. Yeah, that is very good. Uh, also proving your new uh, well, that my situation. internet may be sorted. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, and I had a very good time. Oh, obviously, the concerns at this point are: is it? Did this need to be Splatoon three? Mm. Right. I mean, it's too. It's it's so the same game. In- the incremental. Thing. Right. Yeah. That's the thing. I mean, is it less? Is it? It's more incremental than Splatoon two was. Right. Yeah, Splatoon two felt yeah. like more of a jump. Yeah. Fair. Um, <laughs> Diminishing returns. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, and I'm I'm not sure I'm on board with the. I mean, yeah, okay. Caveats here. It was a Splatfest, right? So the Splatfest music was what you could hear, which is always special for those events. And it's uh, so I haven't really got. I don't think we've got a feel for what the the real music for like the most of the time, most of your time will be in Splatoon will will sound like. So the jury's out on that. I'm not sure I'm so on board with Deep Cut as my uh, choice of presenters and choice of Splatfest music. Uh, I don't think that's necessarily as good. And I think there's elements of the presentation that feel like that maybe aren't quite as impactful as like, I just remember like, especially when you win a game or when you lose a game, that music sting that you got was, was nice and like felt, felt good. And it's like, I'm not sure that the, the current music has as much impact, but maybe those were Splatfest specific stings and that the normal stings are different. I don't know. Yeah. Um, they've kind of jazzed up how all of that stuff looks anyway, because you now get a nice, because there's like more of an emphasis on characters and their banners and what you're, what you look like and what you're, you know, what you call yourself and stuff like that. And, uh, though, though it does a nice flyby of the winners at the end of the match with like celebrations and you'll be able to pick a celebration. Those are unlockables now. Um, mm-hmm. so they've, jazz- they've, j- they've jazzed it up in small ways is what I'm taking away. It's like, it's a, it's a slightly jazzed up version, but, um, zhuzhed up. Zhuzhed, yes. A little, little bit of zhuzh, but it's, uh, I don't know. I think I, there's a... Um, <laughs> if you follow Easy Allies, you will have seen on their thumbnail for their recent podcast of the question, painting by numbers, <laughs> which, you know, I'm going to steal from them because it's a good, <laughs> good... You know, it's good in context of Splatoon. Uh, it's, uh, yeah, there's that, 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 there's that worry that it is just going through the motions. But I still played it nonstop. <laughs> I still, I still, I just, I still, I still well, didn't it, stop. That was the it's thing. still platoon. It's still it's platoon. platoon. Sorry, yeah. platoon. It's platoon. Yeah, it's still that is the pun. That is the pun. <laughs> that is the pun. <laughs> Splat and platoon. So, oh, I, I get it. So it's out on Friday. Is it a triple pun with the word "toon" as well for cartoon? Ooh. Oh, I don't know. It's maybe splat and platoon and cartoon all in one word. All in one. It's a cartoon. What a cartoon! Yes. Okay. So get hope for Splatoon three. We'll have campaigns. Uh, yeah, we still don't know what they're doing in Sandman Run. Is the other thing? That's, that's the other important. Oh yeah. Thing. We don't know what yeah. we're doing. Like how the structure of Samurai Run is going to work. Please, they what haven't mentioned guys. anything about it being time limited. So, for the love of God, I hope it's not. <laughs> That's so dumb that it was before. Yep. Yeah. Uh, what else are we going to talk about? Uh, other multiplayer stuff. I played some. Uh, I didn't talk about this last time because I totally forgot about it. I've got about two things of this ilk, to be honest. Uh, I've played a bit of Multiverses, um, mm-hmm. which is. Uh, Warner Brothers's Smash thing. Smash clone. I can't remember the name of those. What are they called? Smash clones? Platform uh, fighters, I think, is the, line, is the genre. Uh, that thing's all right. Um, I, I mean, it's no Smash, but, but it's all right. Um, I can very much agree with some of the sentiment that's going around that it's like it, it plays well as an, as an, if, as an online <laughs> fighter. It plays very well indeed. Like actually, like like when when the lag is good, it's um it's it's quite good fun. I can't get into it in the same way that I get into Smash though. Smash is about has that zhuzh. Let's do let's say that again. It has that zhuzh. It has that presentation. It has that bang. It has that exactly. hilarity and that yeah. comedy. And I mean, the, the, all just of the possibility space that anything can happen that multiverses doesn't. 
They um, know they're not going to be smashed, right? And they're doing it anyway, right? All these things. <laughs> they're doing it anyway, yeah. Right? Yeah. I do think Multiverse has carves its own little niche, though, and mm. that I can kind of get why this might be a more pro-friendly version of one of these. It's it's technical. There are mechanics. There are awkwardnesses, <laughs> I suppose, mm. into how things work. The characters do behave quite differently and have odd and weird abilities and status effects and cooldowns. There's there's a lot going on, um, mm. but within the concept of your characters, like where Smash Brothers is, there's a lot going on around you. <laughs> Generally, yeah. Not just with you, but around you. There's just things popping off. Um, I, I guess unless you like play it the boring way and turn everything, or turn the items off and you know, <laughs> get serious about it. But I wish uh, my my main problem with multiverses is not what it's going for. It's it's uh, one. I think its presentation needs some work. I think it's kind of dull at the moment, like how it actually looks and sounds, especially how it sounds. Actually, its music is just boring. Uh, it does does that kind of like I don't know I don't even know how to describe it like sort of weak orchestral versions of stuff. It's like they're not even good orchestral mixes like Smash does. They're just kind of like there, and every level has the same style of music. So there's no like we're going to this stage and it's going to sound like this. It's going to we're going to go to this stage and it sounds the same as the other stages. So that's kind mm. of boring. And there's no like big like like. Bam! Versus there, there is a versus screen, but it's not like Smash Brothers has that massive explosion at the start, where it's just like these people are fighting, get hype, and like mm. it doesn't even really count down the start of a match in a cool enough way, where it's like like ready go or whatever it does. It's just like that. Even the start of that is just like there's a countdown at the top of the screen, and then you, then you fight. Like <laughs> just, right, just, yeah, just, yeah. Get, just get going, just get fighting. Don't worry about it. <laughs> it's like a it, it needs a bit more bang. Um, to it um, and also the free to play of the UI is a bit much like it's mm, the Fortniteification of game UIs it's like it's right. a bit messy yeah is that clearly that influence there yeah I think there's a lot of similarity between multiverses so menus and how Fortnite looks it's like mm, it's, a, it's a bit much but they're hugely successful I guess so. yeah. <laughs> yeah very cluttered yeah. Uh, both of which are kind of actually no. I, I'll take it back. The free to playness is not really a problem. That the uh, the presentation and lack of bang and wow, bam, zhuzh, is also missing from Turbo Golf Racing, which is something else I've also been dabbling with. Um, oh yeah, out on early access um, via Game Pass. Um, yeah, that's I I. I when I'm when I, it's another one of these games where it's like I think it has problems and I think it's actually kind of bland and kind of weirdly flat. But once I've started playing it, I have a hard time stopping. Um, so for those, Adelisha, Turbo Golf Racing is literally what it says on the tin. You are a car. You're playing Rocket League, except it's golf. Uh, golf uh, like the golf race mode for Mario Golf, but your car's with a ball and you're hitting it to get it into a hole. Mm. Uh, mm. That's its whole thing. That's it. That's all you need to know. You're you're in a car. You're a car playing golf. Um, except they take away. It's a it's a race, and they take away the whole necessity of shots and all that kind of stuff. You don't have to get par. Um, it's just a race. Get a ball in a hole. Put stuff in things. Put things in hole. Yeah. Put things in holes. <laughs> put things in holes and put them in quicker than anyone else. Um, so. Core gameplay wise, it's like yeah, you hit the ball on the thing. If you hit the ball with the edges of your the front of your wedge that's at the front of the car, you can impart spin on the ball. Okay, and this is both one of the best and worst ideas in the game simultaneously because it's like yeah, that means you can pull off some crazy ass cool shots by like curving it around things. It also means that the the hand because the handling is quite twitchy on the car, lining up a straight damn shot is really properly difficult. Hmm. Which could lead to some madness, like around right, like, and yeah, balls yeah. going all kinds of over the place. But somehow it sort of doesn't. It just ends up being frustrating and dull. Like and like, I can't do what I want to do. Fortunately, like the best way I found to play it is actually to eventually unlock the perk that turns off spin. 
So like I feel like I'm wasting a perk by applying it to my car, but it's like, hey, you can just turn off spin if you want, if that's a pain in the ass. And I'm like, yes, please, I'm going to turn that off. And then I do way better. <laughs> um, so I'm hoping there's like a spin reduction perk rather than a turn off spin at some point. Uh, that's why I can apply it, like just to reduce the effect of it, but so I can still do some cool ass stuff. Uh, also, you're not really fighting any of the other competitors that are on the thing. Like, I really kind of wanted it to be like all the cars are present at the same time, but they're all just sort of ghosts, and the balls are ghosts of each other. And the only real way you interact with each other is there are missile power ups which you can pick up and choose to fire at someone, which will like stun them for like a second. And right. that is it. Otherwise, it's just a straight ass race. And it's like, I think that's a mistake. I think the, you needed to go mad with this. You needed to like be less pure with your golf mm. racing and just go all, all out bonkers. And then it would have been way more appealing. Like, have the cars collide with each other. Have the balls collide with each other. Have weird ass shit that you can, can do to block other players off and perhaps like have things that you can do that will like make the guy in front suffer a little more. Uh, well, I mean, you're basically just saying steal make, rumble away from Frogley. Kind of, <laughs> yeah. The golf. <laughs> but make it into golf, like, or Mario Kart it up a bit more, or something. Like, it's the fact that everyone is a ghost, I think, is a is a mistake. Um, and they also do that thing I mentioned about, like, multiverses and Smash, like, the end of... Ma yeah, when, it, when, it, when a game starts or ends, it's just like, hey, the game's done. And then you finish the match, and it's like, yeah, that match is over. And you came third. Right. No, okay. No even if you win it, even if you no, win, the, the, you play three holes, basically, and you can score, score right. points. Based, like, like more like a race than you do like holes or anything like that. Yeah. Even yeah, if yeah. you win it, it's just like, there's no special music sting. There's no special moment <laughs> where it brings it up. Like the, the background music just keeps playing and it takes you to a menu and it says, yeah, you came first. Well, that's so low key for yeah. what the game is otherwise trying to go for. Yeah. yeah. It just... Sure, this thing is early access, and I really hope they spend some work on it mm. because I think the idea has does have potential. It's just not there where it sits right now. Um, but like I said, saying that when I get when I started playing it last night, I had a real hard time stopping. <laughs> like that's there is just that just the fact that it jumps you back to the menu and you can just push A and jump almost immediately back into another round. It's a uh, it gets its hooks in you, um, even if I have problems with what that game actually is. <laughs> and uh, yeah, it's you know, it's free to play, or it might be it might be free to play when it comes out. I don't know, but like they're going for like a season thing where you earn a, earn cosmetics through play, and you earn a mm -hmm. currency, and you can then mm -hmm. spend that currency at the shop. It, there's currently no microtransactions involved. I don't think you can pay into it. It's all just. But it follows that pattern, that well-worn pattern at this point. Mm -hmm. Topic golf racing. Uh, right. What else we got? Let's let's try and talk about stuff a little bit quicker. Uh, Hollow Knight. I'm not sure I have a huge amount more to add on last time in that I am still playing it. It is still I'm still quite enjoying it, but I'm finding its Metroidvania structure maybe siding too much on the. I'm doing a lot of backtracking kind of kind of stuff. Partly because that game, like as I mentioned before, that game doesn't really handhold you in where to go, and as you un as you discover more and more of the world, that becomes more and more of a problem because then there's more and more areas you might need to return to to find a different route out of. If you see what I mean, so like I'm I'm finding myself confounded yeah. by it more and being like, okay, I actually have no idea what to do next. Um, right, spending more and more time trudging around with the with the very loud footsteps, trying yeah. to find, which is the way <laughs> yeah. forward. And then okay. by accident, you'll stumble upon a, on the thing you're supposed to do, or a room you just didn't happen to go in that for some reason didn't show the route on the map. And then you're like, "Oh, okay, okay, now I'm onto something." Like literally, where I've got it saved at the moment, I'm in an area that I probably could have got to quite a lot earlier, um, but just didn't for some reason. Just didn't didn't find it. Um, so now I'm now covering that area off, which is, uh, you know, nice. It's always nice to find a new area. Um, it has that thing 
that a lot of Metroidvanias do as well, where sometimes the the panic of like you, between save points is real because it's just like I'm a long way from home and I really need to find a save point. Mm. <laughs> I really need to find a save point. Uh, and uh, sometimes that those distances can be a bit long, uh, especially when you're trying to then do a difficult bit that you know is difficult, and you, so you're coming from the save point to the difficult bit, and it's like mm. sometimes that trek can be a bit long. Uh, stuff like that. It's those are all the negatives that are building up. Like it can be a bit frustrating in those ways, but I still think it's really good. I'm still having a, having a good time of it. The boss fights are quite satisfying. Um, pretty much all of them have felt surmountable, if that makes sense. Like yeah. there was one I came across that was pretty much impossible until I leveled up a bit and had a specific charm that made it an absolute cakewalk. Um, okay. I don't know how I was going to have done that. Like, Do it otherwise. At yeah. the state I was in when I discovered it. Um, and I'm glad, like, most of the other fights, I've sort of bashed my head against it a bit until I've done them. But this one I bailed relatively quickly on and thought, you know what, I'll come back to that. And then I came back to it and it was a cakewalk. Um, so, correct decision, because it didn't actually give me anything useful at the end of it either, so that was, that was annoying. <laughs> mm. Uh but it is good. It is good. I still think there's a lot of that to go, actually. Um, I've played quite a bit of it, and I still think there's a, quite a bit to go. Uh, so that's Hollow Knight. Uh, let's very briefly talk about my adventures in VR over the last two weeks. Uh, I tinkered around with this thing. I'm, at, I'm having that gun game itch, is what's happening to me at the moment. Right. I'm having that, oh my god, I need to play some Time Crisis. Um, or Point Blank and stuff of that era. It's like, So I stumbled upon this thing called Emu VR because a bit of me was thinking, well, hang on a minute. It, like, Surely the controllers in a VR headset can work pretty much like a light gun. Isn't there a way I can just tie this up to emulation and like point at the thing I want to point at and that will feel close enough? Uh, turns out I wasn't. I'm definitely not the first person to have that thought process. <laughs> um, and whilst um, my original thought was like, "Oh, I can just do this with a virtual desktop, right?" and map the controller to the buttons I need, and then it will work. Yeah, that's actually not currently possible because they don't map to the mouse quite right. Like, there's some limitations in how that works, and so and that that's not actually possible just yet. Frustratingly, um, so I found. But the closest thing I to to do. To, to recreate it is this thing called emu vr um and emu vr tries to rep recreate the feeling of playing old games by putting you in a 90s bedroom an 80s slash 90s bedroom and uh putting a massive crt screen in front of you and you playing it in vr in the setting you probably originally played it in it's it's a proper nostalgia trip <laughs> um and to that end, it's actually pretty effective. Like, the room, it works well. Like, the fact that it has physical versions of a PlayStation 1 in its world, and I kind of, <laughs> yeah, actually forces you. Like, if the if the console you want to play on isn't hooked up to a TV, you've got to hook it up to the TV <laughs> in VR and be like, right, this TV's attached to this thing. I, I, I spawned in a massive, um, what they call PVMs, like the, the professional monitors, like this old Sony but not Sony. They call oh, it those things, yeah. Um, and just put it on the bed in this room because it was enormous. It's like, where am I going to put this thing? Right, okay, I'll just put it on the bed for now. <laughs> this massive pedo and rigged a PlayStation 1 to it. You do have to go through quite a lot of faff to get your games into it in the right place. It relies on a specific version of RetroArch under the hood to, to play the games. Um, so you have to make sure you get hold of that, put that in the right place, put your games in a specific place, run its own specific game loaders, to, to make it so it recognizes what's there. If you want the graphics so you know what you're doing in the game, you then have to go fight, hunt down the label graphics for the games as well and put them in the right place. It's a whole thing. Um, and it takes a bit of effort to get set up. Um, and when you do get it set up, I found it okay, <laughs> which is a bit, there's a, like, it's most of the way there to the point where I think most people aren't going to notice the core problem, which is trigger latency. Uh, and ah. so it does have light gun support. So this is the whole thing why I was investigating EVVI. It's like it has light gun support for PS1, Dreamcast, and NES. 
I think, are the things it does. You might be able to play like Super Scope and stuff on it as well. Um, so I was giving Point Blank a good go because that requires pretty rapid trigger <laughs> action and so mm. works out as a pretty good test for this stuff. Uh, and unfortunately, I think it suffers from having slightly too much trigger latency um, for you to be perfectly accurate and to be perfect at these things. Um, but it's not bad. It's not. It's not the worst. Like I said, I don't think most people are gonna gonna realize what's going on here. Um, and there's also like a little bit of inaccuracy, I think, because of frame rate differences. Right, the frame rate of the headset is running at somewhere like either seventy two or ninety, depending on what your headset kicks out hertz. And of course, a PS One is going to be running at somewhere between fifty and sixty hertz, depending on which region of PlayStation you're trying to play. And as a result, you end up with a frame rate mismatch, which means that certain things don't always appear right. So there's supposed to be a bright white flash whenever you shoot yeah. a gun in light gun games. Of course. Because of how the tech worked. That's how and it used to work, yeah. And you can tell that that's sometimes not happening right because sometimes you don't see that flash, which means you're probably missing a frame somewhere um, in the emulation uh, or you know, just couldn't be displayed in the VR world because of a... Right, so sometimes you see it and sometimes you don't. Sometimes you don't, yeah. So that's, oh, okay. that's an immediate so clue know. that something's not quite right. Yeah. Um, but it's pretty close, is what I would say. It's pretty close to the ideal. And to be fair... A, a, an Oculus Touch controller doesn't feel like a gun. <laughs> it just doesn't. No. Um, and they the, and the, the the implementation here puts a Nez Zapper in your hand, which is kind of funky. So you're playing. Oh, like, okay. You're playing playing like point blank with a Nez Zapper, which is I don't know. It's kind of cool. <laughs> sure. Uh, and it even has an option to like scam it a bit, so it, so it lets you dual wield. <laughs> so you can have like two Nez Zappers and be like, bah, 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 bah. I was like I couldn't do that properly. <laughs> Well, these dick games didn't support that for real. Uh, it's okay. It's like it's it's kind of reaffirming that at some point I should probably buy one of those Sindens and uh, and just right, do, and just yeah, do it properly do it for reals. Yeah, yeah. because um, yeah. I did mess around with PCX sometimes. <laughs> yeah, because I did mess around with PCSX two and its light gun emulation to just see if it would like is the latency just a core part of the is it just an emulation problem at this point or is mm. it emu vr adding latency and it the number of steps it has to go through to get it into my head um and unfortunately i think it is emu vr adding latency for the number of steps it went through i played i played tc2 on pcsx2 which isn't supported by emu vr i have to I have to admit that's the playstation 2 isn't yet support like gun support isn't in emu vr yet um but it's a uh, yeah, that playing with the mouse that felt responsive as hell, which is a good sign for when this, if I do get a Sindon, because that means the emulation is not at fault. Mm. Uh, also, TC two is out of the game. Um, <laughs> uh, so yeah, so I, I mucked around with that for a little bit, um, and then I played something that was designed for VR properly, Shooty Fruity. I finally got around to playing that thing again. Not quite light guns. Not quite light guns, no, <laughs> but it has gun but play made in it. for the tech, yeah. And uh, that game has good gun feel. <laughs> Those guns feel good to shoot. Like, there's just some nice kickback on it. I bought the PC version specifically <laughs> over the Oculus version because I knew the graphics were going to be nicer, like, and yeah. stuff like that. Like, I'd watched footage of the Oculus version and be like, this kind of actually looks a little too cut back. I want that ridiculous right, yeah. bright flash that happens when these guns shoot. And uh, which is like dynamic lighting, I think, is one of the things they took out of the Oculus version. Oh, and okay. um, uh, yeah, so I'm playing the PC version through Steam. And yeah, shooting a gun in that game feels good, <laughs> which is kind of important because you're shooting fruit. And because uh, <laughs> you're shooting fruit, you're shooting fruit with guns. And uh, yeah, so this is probably the first, like, other than Beat Saber, it's the only other real sort of like commercial product I've played in VR, like other than just cocking around with it, <laughs> really. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, yeah, it, um, it's 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 real good. It's a whole <laughs> lot of fun. Um, uh, for those who haven't caught the many times I've talked about it before, wanting to play it, uh, it's you're simultaneously scanning food at a checkout in a supermarket. Yeah. Which earns you upgrades 
to your guns and superpowers at some points. Uh, whilst guns come across on a rail above you, uh, and then fruit get angry and start attacking your desk. Um, angry. <laughs> how rude. Uh, like giant Very mutant rude. fruit. So you're grabbing guns off the rail to shoot the fruit whilst you're scanning food in order to upgrade the guns that you're using to shoot more fruit. Uh, simple loop, but it works. Um, uh, and it's a whole bunch of fun. I, I, I enjoy it a lot. It's it's really great. <laughs> um, the one thing I, I the, my one complaint with it is the voiceover, because they've gone for this like deadpan. It's your day on the job. You know, it, it helps if you shoot the fruit or shoot your guns rather than throwing them. You're doing really terribly. <laughs> like it's just that's oh, their, that's their choice of VO, and there's not enough lines. They repeat a lot. Um, and because it's so deadpan, it's like I get the joke. They're going for like the bored supermarket clerk kind of thing, I guess. Like, but yeah, it doesn't work. It doesn't work. It doesn't work for long enough. It works well right. enough for a demo, but not for a full game, right? It's, but it doesn't need to work that well, luckily. No, if they had just, just if they had just turned off the number of repeats or had it like I don't know, maybe ten times more voice lines, then it would be okay. But uh, but as it stands, it's like it's a little too repetitive. Um, I don't need to know what each menu does when I go and visit that menu. You don't have to tell me about it because they actually have a fairly decent help system in the game as well, right? Like, they like yeah, it tells you that like the voiceover lady is telling you how to do this, how to start your job or start mm -hmm. a level. It's like you can even squeeze off a few frustration rounds. It's like I know I've been here like twenty times. <laughs> like you don't have to tell me again. Um, uh, like, uh, but they, they just like every console you go to has a big help button on it, and you push the help button with your hand, and a printer will print out the instructions for the thing you're looking at, and you can pick it up with your hand and just look at this bit of paper with the instructions on. It's like you don't need to read, like, voice me the instructions every single time. That's my no. one complaint for the game. That is my one yeah. complaint. Like, everything else no. is great, <laughs> it's pretty good for a rub review. Yeah. <laughs> The ever important question in this situation, which I think we've asked about several games recently, is can you just go in the options when you turn down the voice individually? Yes, you can. <laughs> okay, good. So so solved. You, you can do that. So that's that's that is a. Um, I haven't yet done it because a bit of me is just like I, there's still there's three different level types uh, on it, and I, I mm, some some of the things you shoot at occasionally have a voice line attached to them, and I kind of want to hear them, right. but maybe when I've like finished all the levels and unlock all the stuff maybe then i actually want to turn that off and like not subject anyone else to it <laughs> um so i'm i'm putting up with it for now lest it says something clever <laughs> but yes you can just straight up turn it off they thought of that well Sort of. Maybe they didn't think of it. They maybe. didn't think of this use case. They thought that they should have a volume control to make the voices more or less distinct for people who can hear voices better. Or less. I, guess, I guess that's true. Yeah, <laughs> that's that's probably the reasoning. Shooty fruity, Rob recommend. As you always have. As I always have. Um, yeah, however before, many years it's been before I played it for, played it properly. Yeah. Many many games, VR games, shooting games. All the games. Game! Games. Is that you then, Rob? That is me. Cool. Uh, I think we're out of time. I've been just playing more into the breach. I've just about figured out mm. how to do the normal mode, I think, with the ice dudes. Awesome. So I need to, yeah, I need to pick the next um, team or whatever. <laughs> I'm trying to... I'm literally googling like what are the best teams <laughs> just, and just do, do the easiest ones, yeah. not easiest, but like the most powerful ones. I, I guess because if I choose a bad one, I'm definitely going to get destroyed. Yeah. So, so are you okay. playing with advanced edition turned on, or are you? Well, have you turned it no, off I suppose to, not. to still learn it. Yeah, I, I don't. I haven't add, added any of the new features, or I haven't tried it because you can mix and match, can't you? You yeah. can use teams from the advanced mode, and you can turn on the advanced enemies. But yeah. I didn't well, you turn on just... like all the advanced parts individually, even in that first. Yeah, time. you can toggle them all. Which uh, is cool. But I haven't toggled. I haven't toggled any, but we're doing that for in the video series. So, yes. which yeah, you we, can catch everything on, turned on. Haven't we? Yes. Yeah, because I've also been playing some <laughs> mid-freaks for like as a little bit yeah. with none of the advanced stuff turned on. 
Oh right, just keeping yeah. it, keeping it clean. <laughs> Playing one of the apparently keeping much harder teams. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah, you you were at that level. I'm still, <laughs> I'm still, but I can just about thanks to your uh, us, us playing it together on on normal with one of those advanced teams. I'm starting to see. It's a bit uh, like I'm, I'm having the same to plan things out a bit better. Yeah, I'm having the same thing with our playthrough of Into the Breach that I had with FTL, and that I find it way more compelling with playing it with yeah, someone and talking. It's it kind of more fun, yeah. yeah, to talk through rather than trying to think it out yourself and then being like, oh fuck, I screwed it up, and now I've run out of retries. Yeah. yeah. This is um, yeah. This this in a in a strange way for me. This is the, the our video series is how we should have. That's how I should always play this game. <laughs> like, I, I, I kind of don't want to do it on my own. It, like I'm just staring at a situation, being like, I have one fewer than I need to actually deal with everything. Yeah, it's you like know, it's like a lot of things in 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 life. I find it like. It, Into the Breach just makes me realize things about, like, oh, no, no, in my work day, when I come across a problem that I'm actually having a hard time solve, sometimes just talking to someone oh, about yeah, it, yeah. even if they don't know Rubber what ducking. you're talking about, sometimes it just kind of makes you think, I'm overthinking this. Yeah. Like, you know, exactly. or like, I'm, do- I'm going about this the wrong way. I'd, yeah. And I've, I've, I've literally just talked myself into the answer. And like, yeah, yeah. playing Into the Breach, like, with someone does that. Like, for sure. So I don't ever want to so, play yeah. on my own again. Is what I'm saying. It's like, <laughs> oh, like okay, fair like, enough. Well, we, we had we'll the same problem when we played series. FTL. It's like I didn't go back to it after we played it because it was just oh. like, no, actually, this was way more fun playing it this way than it yeah. was the other way. Uh, so I've kind of screwed myself. Is what I'm saying. <laughs> <laughs> but that's okay. You could play it that way. But yeah. it's, it's a good game either way. It was a good game. And you can watch us play more of that on YouTube. Happy Salad is our channel. It is and. Uh, there are other videos on there, so check those out. Um, Ocarina of Time playthrough, etc. And uh, this has been our podcast. It's called The Salacast. And uh, we'll be back in another couple of weeks with another one. So please join us then if you want to listen to us talk. <laughs> <laughs> if you enjoyed this one. Uh, and we'll there aren't you that many other bits of audio on this podcast, so uh, I hope you like us talking. It's a little bit of music, which has probably already started at this point. Oh, maybe not. No, I out. mean, the, the lead in's about 20 we're seconds. I've worked it, it out. Now. Yeah, we're transitioning um, to it. <laughs> goodbye. <laughs> Bye.